No, no, they're just around the corner. Yeah, I know. That's why I said I'll get them. You're being very kind. Okay. Oh dear. Exited host mode. We shouldn't have beaten host mode. Hello. Hello. Ah, there is a man in by the name of Convict. Hello, Convict. How are you? Hope you are well. Welcome to, I think. I'm going to angle back. Phone just a little bit. I'm using Mrs. Owl's marvellous vlogging camera stand just for a just for a change. In pain and feeling down in the ground. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Is it, is it the old injury? Well, put your feet up. Let us look after you for an afternoon. Um, we shall take care of thee. And we were a little late starting to. Day, but for very good reasons. We were out having a walk, which is always, I think, a great reason to be, uh, to be, uh, absolutely. Lewis is here. Hello, Lewis. How are you? Now I've got a nice seat in the sun. I've got my Korean slippers on. Um, I'm here. Quick, say something. Say anything. <laughs> oh, of course. Yes. Sorry, comment. I, I had, in fact, you're quite right, I had remembered that fact. Um, let's take some, let's do some, we'll do some reading to take our, uh, uh, to mind, uh, take our minds off things. Thank you, Lewis. Posture check for me. We've also changed the chat points just for, um, just for today. So there's no dramatic readings, there's no haikus and sonnets. The man himself of legend it is the Phoenix. What a stream it was last night. I must join you for, um, uh, among Us. Uh, it looked like marvellous fun. Convict, you've redeemed it too soon. I've still got a coffee. <laughs> but Convict has redeemed already a brew. Um, so there shall indeed be tea. Get yourself a cup of tea. Um, Do you want me to make you some? No, no, I'm still drinking the coffee. Uh, Convict. Well, I could drink that. You could, <laughs> you could have my coffee. Yeah. <laughs> this is how eminently clever. Um... Love the scenery. Thank you very much. I'm in, this is a brand new corner uh, um, uh, of our street. This is uh, Mrs. Al Cactus Centre in the Sutherland. Um, she's kindly afforded me a little seat in the corner today. It's, uh, it's lovely. I've got the garden over here. I've got sunlight coming through. Um, it's, uh, it's absolutely lovely. Um, <clears throat> the only problem for poor Mrs. Al, she's got to listen to me waffle on now for, um, for a good few bucks. Uh, Mm. There we go. If you need any more water or anything, I, I may well be shouting, especially if it's two hours of uh, two hours of me talking. Um, and this is you, I suppose you guys asked for this. It was our community challenge. Um, <laughs> I mean, it almost forgot I was going to. It was it was going to be a reading stream. Um, no, yes, this is the community challenge. Uh, you guys donated twenty thousand chat points. Um, for, for, for book reading um, and so we selected a few uh, I've picked well the first one is I suppose thanks to uh, someone with without which uh, these streams would simply never happen um, and that's of course Mrs Al um, so she'd be in the backbone of everything that really happened around here um, it's her request for some Edgar Allan Poe uh, I've never read this before either, so we're going to start, and I'm going to get cracking, because um, it's a nice sunshiny day, <clears throat> and we've got plenty to be reading, um, plenty to sit back and relax with, and I know Omega's feeling a little worse for wear yet from yesterday, so we shall take a nice gentle plod, um, 
to start with through Edgar Allan Poe and the murders in the Rue Morgue. Bookmark, pop it here. So, the murders in the Rue Morgue. What song the siren sang, or what name Achilles assumed when he hid himself among women, although puzzling questions, are not beyond all conjecture. A quote by Sir Thomas Brown. The mental features discord discoursed. What? It's a good start. Hang on. Hang on. Wait a minute. That's. It's not, not the most dramatic style. Ah, right, okay. The mental features discoursed of as the analytical are in themselves but little susceptible of analysis. We appreciate them only in their effects. We know of them, amongst other things, that they are always to their possessor, when inordinately possessed, a source of the liveliest enjoyment. As the strong man exults in his physical ability, delighting in such exercises as call his muscles into action, so glories the analyst in that moral activity which disentangles. He derives pleasure from even the most trivial occupations, uh, bringing his talent into play. He is fond of enigmas, of conundrums, of hieroglyphics, exhibiting in his solutions of each a degree of acumen which appears to the ordinary apprehension preternatural. His results, brought about by the very soul and essence of method, have, in truth, the whole air of intuition. The faculty of resolution is possible, possibly much invigorated by mathematical study, and especially by that highest branch of it which unjustly and merely on account of its retrograde operations has been called, as if par excellence, analysis. Yet to calculate it is not in itself to analyse. A chess player, for example, uh, does the one without effort at the other. It follows that the game of chess, in its effects upon mental character, is greatly misunderstood. I am not now writing a treatise, or treatise even, but simply prefacing a somewhat peculiar narrative by observations very much at random. I will therefore take occasion to assert that the higher powers of the reflective intellect are more decidedly and more usefully tasked by the un... Know, by the unostentatious game of drafts than by all the elaborative frivolities of chess. In this latter, where the pieces have different and bizarre motions uh, with various and variable values, what is only complex is mistaken, and not unusual error, for what is profound. The attention is here called powerfully into play. If it flag for an instant, an oversight is committed, resulting in injury or defeat. The possible moves being not only manifold, but in involute, the chances of such oversights are multiplied. And in nine cases out of ten, it is the more concentrated rather than the more acute player who conquers. In drafts, on the contrary, where the moves are unique and have but little variation, the probability of inadvertence are diminished, and the mere attention being left comparatively unemployed. What advantages are obtained by either party are obtained by superior acumen. To be less abstract... Let us suppose a game of draughts where the pieces are reduced to four kings and where, of course, no oversight is to be expected. It is obvious that here the victory can be decided, the players all being equal, only by some recherche movement, the result of some strong exertion of the intellect. Hello, Mr. Nosler. Hello. It's so lovely to have you. <laughs> Deprived of ordinary resources, the analyst throws himself into the spirit of his opponent identifies himself therewith and not unfrequently sees thus, at a glance, the sole methods, sometimes indeed absurdly simple ones, by which he may seduce into error or hurry into miscalculation.
Hmm? Um, no, I've, I am. Uh, I was just trying to keep the mood. Um, oh, okay. There are chat points, by the way, if you want me to stop for like 10 or 15 minutes and we'll just have a chat. I should have said that at the start. Carrying on. Well, whilst has long been noted for its influence upon what is deemed the calculating power, and men of the highest order of intellect have been known to take an apparently unaccountable delight in it, while eschewing chess is frivolous. Beyond that, there is nothing of a similar nature so greatly tasking the faculties of analysis. The best chess player in Christendom may be little more than the best player of chess, but proficiency in whist implies capacity for success in all those more important undertakings where mind struggles with mind. When I say proficiency, I mean that perfection in the game, which includes a comprehension of all the sources whence legitimate advantage may be derived. These are not only manifold, but multifold, and lie frequently among recesses of thought, altogether inaccessible to the ordinary understanding. To observe attentively is to remember distinctly, and, so far, the concentrative chess player will do very well at Weist, while the rule of Hoyle, themselves based upon the mere mechanism of the game, are sufficiently and generally comprehensible. Thus, to have a retentive memory and to proceed by the book are points commonly regarded as the sum total of good play. But it is in matters beyond the limits of mere rule that the skill of the analyst is evidenced. He makes, in silence, a host of observations and inferences. So, perhaps, do his companions, and the difference in the extent of the information obtained lies not so much in the validity of the inference as in the quality of the observation. The necessary knowledge is that of what to observe. Our player confines himself not at all, nor because the game is the object does he reject deductions from things external to the game. He examines the countenance of his partner, comparing it carefully with that of each of his opponents. He considers the mode of assorting the cards in each hand, often counting trump by trump and honour by honour through the glances bestowed by their holders upon each. He notes every variation of face as the play progresses, gathering a fund of thoughts from the differences in the expressions of certainty, of surprise, of triumph or of char. From the matters of gathering up a trick, he judges whether the person taking it can make another in the suit. He recognises what is played through feint by the air with which it is thrown upon the table, a casual or inadvertent word to the accidental dropping or turning of a card, with the accompanying anxiety or carelessness in regard to its concealment, accounted tricks, with the order of their arrangement, embarrassment, hesitation, eagerness, or trepidation, all four to his apparently intuitive perception, indications of the true state of affairs. The first two or three rounds having been played, he is in full possession of the contents of each hand, and thenceforth puts down his cards with an absolute a precision of purpose, as if the rest of the party had turned outwards the faces of their own. The analytical power should not be confounded with simple ingenuity, for while the analyst is necessarily ingenious, the ingenious man is often remarkably incapable of analysis. The constructive or combining power by which ingenuity is usually manifested and to which phrenologists, I believe erroneously, have assigned a separate organ supposing it with the primitive faculty having been so frequently seen in those whose intellect bordered otherwise on pon idiocy. idiocy. That's a tongue twister. As to have attracted general observation amongst writers on morals. Hello, Reaper. How are you? You're painting a flat. My God, you're lurking us while painting a flat, you brave fellow. I shall spare you on with very intellectual writings, Mr. Edgar. Between ingenuity and the analytic ability, there exists a difference far greater, indeed, than that between the fancy and the imagination, but of a character very strictly analogous. 
It will be found, in fact, that the ingenious are always fanciful, and the truly imaginative never otherwise than analytic. The narrative which follows will appear to the reader somewhat in the light of a commentary upon the propositions just advanced. Residing in Paris during the spring and part of the summer of 18 dash, I there became acquainted with a Monsieur C. Auguste Dupin. This young gentleman was of an excellent, indeed of an illustrious family, but by a variety of untoward events had been reduced to such poverty that the energy of his character succumbed beneath it, and he ceased to bestir himself into the world, or to care for the retrieval of his fortunes. But, ah, convict has paused me. He would like me to chat, to chat. <laughs> Thank you very much, convict. I, I've never read this before. This is marvellous. So, how's everyone enjoying it so far? Volume all right? Hmm. And Reaper, are you doing a whole flat? Because it's already half past two on a Sunday afternoon. Um, that's an impressive undertaking. I am enjoying the book. It's, um... I like the fact that we are... We're not that far. One, two, three, three and a bit pages in, and I spent the entire time basically setting up the the mental fa faculties of the protagonists. It seems like, and this is how we'll know better. In fact, she she loves this one. She's read it. I've never read it before, so I've no idea. But we seem to be talking about what are the cogs, the engines of thought that will make these individual players in the book separated from each other. Uh, which I think is very clever. Um, I like setting that up in advance. Although there are some words that are catching me out here and there as I'm either reading too quickly or I think I know what it is they're about to say. And it turns out actually, um, uh, not so much. <laughs> but a nice op ideal opportunity to sit and have a sip of coffee. Sitting and sipping a bit of coffee in the sun whilst reading a book is... Um, I don't know what you think. That's a nice way to spend an afternoon. Mm -hmm. mm. How did I come to these three books? Well, the first was in honour of um, the lovely Mrs. Al, who is just there, in fact, doing some artwork, um, as these streams really wouldn't happen without her. Um, so her pick was for some Edgar Allan Poe. I Because I knew how long this was, I threw into the mix a spot of Tolkien, um, because, one, I've never read it before. Two, I'm hoping it will fit my general reading style, and it gives us an idea of the sorts of things we might do in the future. I picked the third one as a starter because um, it was, I think, one of the first ones suggested and it cost about 99p on the Kindle. <laughs> there was a certain cost evaluation. But if this goes well and people enjoy it, uh, we might have a talk at the end of the stream about how this might become a more permanent um, state of affairs, this particular type of stream. Because uh, let's face it, there are plenty of books out there um, and I have, a, uh, I have a nice spot in the sun, uh, which is always going to suit me very well. And I've already got a have a cup of tea in the bag, courtesy of your good self. So the only thing actually I'm struggling with is not leaning down to do face reveals. Um, <clears throat> because I had wondered if um, the UK's COVID situation wasn't as it was about going and picking up some books from the family. But... Um, I think I'm quite glad that we picked just a couple to start with. That I'll explain as well when we get to the Tolkien one that they, this is hopefully quite a short one. The Tolkien one, um, uh, I can do excerpts from, and I'll explain why when I get there. Well, actually, no, you'll see from Instagram. It's um, Baron and Luthien, and uh, I shall get to talking about that um, when we get there. But it's an interesting, it's an interesting Tolkien if you don't know it. It's definitely nothing like what you'll have heard before. Uh, and then lastly, another book I've never heard, which is, I think, a dystopian future, courtesy of uh, Fox's suggestion. Um, and, and that's going to be our third for the day, because honestly, I don't know how long it'll take me to read each of these. Uh, I mean, that's not too much. Yeah, but I'm not... Not read I'm loving this. That is great. I can't believe I've not read it before. And you'll forgive me if I break off a character, because really, we are just sort of sat here and... Um, being all creative, it's very lovely. What, what are you drawing, love? I didn't even ask before I sat down. Carrying on what I started this morning. All oh, right, okay. Um, 
You can't be. You, you tell me what it is and I will go looking. I know I've already got one of your suggestions noted down in my little book, um, and that's for the Maze Runner, uh, book one. Um, but as ever, um, in fact, I shall lean across. Look at this. Look at this for technology. Is this going to work? If I do that and put a banana, exclamation mark, Discord, and don't hit the plus button. Thank you very much, Omega, for the hydrate. I'm going to take the opportunity for water and for coffee. You can absolutely have some of my coffee. I always share the last bit of my... It's technically a mocha, so it's really nice because it's, it's half hot chocolate and half coffee. But if you've ever got ideas for food, or things you want read, just pop them in our Discord channel. We may not always get to them in exactly the right order, but I always read all the suggestions. Um, none of them ever get left out. Um, oh, this shirt's not doing my stomach any favors. Omega, thank you very much. I'm going to... Do you, want to, do, you want to, do you want to grab it from me, love? Yeah, I'll come in. You've got to keep yourself hydrated and that voice lubricated. <laughs> um, oh, kitten. Of course. Uh, do you know, I'd forgotten kitten said that. Alice in Wonderland is another one. Oh, that's cool. That's a good idea. Um, I'll add that into the list. Thank you very much. Do you want to have the end of it? Oh, Go on, have the end of it. Thank you. Are you sure? <clears throat> I'm absolutely sure. We'll have some tea. Comics already offered me some tea, so I'll have some bonfire tea at the next break. Do you want me to make it? It's all right, I'll have it at the next break. Okay. Right, folks, what do we think? So, oh, well, where did I leave off? You can um, just do the voice. I'm worried at the voice. What are you worried about, love? What are you, are you worried that it's not being enjoyed? Mm. Folks, are we enjoying this? Um, I will do comments. That's a very good idea. Um, I'm sorry I'm enjoying it. If anyone's really not enjoying this um, or can't get their heads around it, you can shout. But otherwise, I'm going to crack on because we've just met. Uh, also, what a great name. If he comes up, I'm going to give an accent if I can. Monsieur Dupin. Um, <laughs> what does that mean? Like, Mr. of the Bread? <laughs> Technically, it would be if I'm Mr. of the Bread. Um, that's appropriate for us, isn't it? Um... <laughs> Um, okay, where was we? We just met Mr. Dupin, the young gentleman of excellent character. Uh, let's just see. Oh, yes. Um, he basically, he's come upon hard times. Um, um, and there, see, so to care for the retrieval is... So essentially, this man's been on down times. Um, and he doesn't really want to come on out um, of his house, in short. So let's pick up from there. Um, there we go. And thank you for the break, Conway. That was very nice. By courtesy of his creditors, there still remained in his possession a small remnant of his patrimony. And upon the income arising from this, he managed, by means of a rigorous economy, to procure the, necess the necessaries of life, without troubling himself about its superfluities. Books, indeed, were his sole luxury. And in Paris, these are easily obtained. Our first meeting was at an obscure library in the Rue Montar... Hang on. In the Rue Mont... It doesn't help that there's a hyphen halfway through Mont... Montmartre. There you go. Our first meeting was at an obscure library in the Rue Montmartre, where the accident of our both being in search of the same very rare and very remarkable volume brought us into closer communion. We saw each other again and again. I was deeply interested in the little family history which he detailed to me in all that candour which a Frenchman indulges whenever mere self is his theme. I was astonished, too, at the vast extent of his reading, and, above all, I felt my soul enkindled within me by its wild fervour and the vivid freshness of his imagination. Seeking in Paris the objects I then sought, I felt that the society of such a man would be to me a treasure beyond price. And this feeling I frankly confided to him. It was at length arranged that we should live together during my stay in the city, and as my worldly circumstances were somewhat less embarrassed than his own, I was permitted to be at the expense of renting and furnishing in a style which suited the rather fantastic gloom of our common temper. A time-eaten and grotesque mansion, long deserted through superstitions, into which we did not acquire, and tottering to its fall in a retired and desolate portion of the Fabourge Saint-Germain. 
had the routine of our life at this place been now to the world, we should have been perhaps regarded as madmen, although perhaps as madmen of a harmless nature. Our seclusion was perfect. We admitted no visitors. Indeed, the locality of our retirement had been kept carefully a secret from my own former associates, and it had been many years since Dupin had ceased to know or be known in Paris. We existed within ourselves alone. It was a freak of fancy, my friend, for what else shall I call it, to be enamoured of the night for her own sake, and into this bizarrerie, as into all his others, I quietly fell, giving myself up to his wild whims with a perfect abandon. Uh, lurking while streaming, no worries, Reeves, I hope the stream's going very well. Thank you for lurking. I shall, I shall narrate gently whatever you're streaming. Uh, the sable divinity would not herself dwell with us, uh, with us all, but we could counterfeit her presence. At the first dawn of the morning, we closed all the massy shutters of our old building, lighting a couple of tapers which, strongly perfumed, threw out only the ghastliest and feeblest of rays. By the aid of these, we then busied our souls in dreams, reading, writing, or conversing, until warned by the clock of the advent of the true darkness. Then we sallied forth into the streets, arm in arm, continuing the topics of the day, or roaming far and wide until a late hour, seeking amid the wild white lights and shadows of the populous city that infinite of mental excitement which quiet observation can afford. At such times I could not help remarking and admiring, although from his rich ideality I had been prepared to expect it, a particular analytical ability in Dupin. He seemed, too, to take an eager delight in its exercise, if not exactly it's in its display, and did not hesitate to confess the pleasure thus derived. He boasted to me with a low, chuckling laugh that most men, in respect to himself, bore windows in their bosoms and was wont to follow up such assertions by direct and very startling proofs of his intimate knowledge of my own. His manner at these moments was frigid and abstract. His eyes were frigid in expression, while his voice, usually a rich tenor, rose into a treble which would have sounded petulant but for the deliberateness and entire distinctness of the enunciation. Observing him in these moods, I often dwelt meditatively upon the old philosophy of the bipart soul, and amused myself with the fancy of a double Dupin, the creative and the resolver. Let it not be supposed, from what I have just said, that I am detailing any mystery or penning any romance. What I have described in The Frenchman was merely the result of an excited or perhaps a diseased intelligence. But of the character of his, his remarks, at the period in question and example, will best convey the idea. We were strolling one night down a long and dirty street in the vicinity of the Palais Royal. Being both apparently occupied with thought, neither of us had spoken a syllable for fifteen minutes at least. All at once, Dupin broke forth with these words, and here comes a very poor French accent. He is a very little fellow, that's true, and would do better for the Théâtre de Varité. <laughs> Shall I abandon the accent? <laughs> there can be no doubt of that, I replied unwittingly, and not at first observing, so much had I been absorbed in reflection the extraordinary manner in which the speaker chimed in with my meditations. In an instant afterwards, I recollected myself, and my astonishment was profound. Dupin, said I, gravely, this is beyond my comprehension. I do not hesitate to say that I am amazed, and can scarcely credit my senses. How was it possible you should know I was thinking of... Here I paused to ascertain, beyond a doubt, whether he really knew of whom I thought. Of Chantillet, he said. Why do you pause? You were remarking to yourself that his diminutive figure unfitted him for tragedy. Tailored down the French accent. This was precisely what had formed the subject of my reflections. Chantillet was a quondam cobbler of the Rue Saint-Denis, who, becoming stage mad, had attempted the role of Xerxes in Crébillon's tragedy, so-called, and had been notoriously God, was that? Pasquinadet for his pains. 
Tell me for heaven's sake, I exclaimed, the method, if method there is, by which you have enabled to fathom my soul in this matter. In fact, I was even more startled than I would have been willing to express. It was the fruitiere, replied my friend, who brought to you the conclusion that the menders of souls were not of sufficient act for Xerxes, et ingenus om. The fruitier, you astonish me. I know no fruitier in whom whatsoever. The man who rang up against you as we entered the street, it may have been fifteen minutes ago. I now remember that, in fact, a fruitier, carrying upon his head a large basket of apples, had nearly thrown me down. Uh, by accident, as we passed from the rue... I'm going to pause it. This is that. Why do they keep putting dashes in the main, in the middle of street names? I'm not meant to know. I mean, it is in France. I never encountered that as a writing. Oh. Uh, maybe it's like him not remembering and it's like Rue something or other. Oh, right. Or... Something. Something. Okay, from the Rue something. Um, <laughs> in, in, into, the, into the thoroughfare where we stood. But what this had to do with Chantelet, I could not possibly understand. There was not a particular of Chalantarani about Dupin, I will explain, he said, and that you may well uh, comprehend all clearly. We will first retrace the course of your meditations from the moment in which I spoke to you until that of the rencontre with the fruitier in question. The larger links of the chain run thus. Chantelier, Orion, Nico, Epicurus, Stelotomi, the street stones, the fruitier. What accent is this? This is sw know, this is awful. swung from French to Italy. Maybe we'll drop the accent. There are few persons who have not, at some period of their lives, amused themselves in retracing the steps by which particular conclusions of their own minds have been attained. The occupation is often full of interest, and he who attempts it for the first time is astonished by the apparently ill. Ill illimitable distance and incoherence between the starting point and the goal. What then must have been my amazement when I heard the Frenchman speak what he had just spoken with that appalling accent, and when I could not help acknowledging that he had spoken truth, he continued. We had been talking of horses, if I remember aright, just before leaving the room, something, something, something. This was the last subject we discussed. As we crossed into the street, a fruitier, with a large basket upon his head, brushing past, quickly past us, thrust you upon a pile of paving stones, and collected at a spot with the causeways undergoing repair. You stepped upon one of those loose fragments, slipped, slightly strained your ankle, appearing vexed or sullied, muttered a few words, turned to look at the pile, and then proceeded in silence. I was not particularly attentive to what you did, but observation has become with me of late species of necessity. You kept your eyes upon the ground, glancing with a petulant expression at the holes and ruts in the pavement, so that I saw you were still thinking of the stones, until we reached the little alley called La Mamatine. It's not called that at all, it's called La Martine, which has been paved by way of experiment with the overlapping and riveted blocks. Here your countenance brightened up, and perceiving your lips move, I could not doubt that you murmured the words sterotomy, a term very effectively applied to this species of pavement. I knew that you could not say to yourself sterotomy without being brought to think of atomies, and thus of the theories of Epicurus. And since, when we discussed this subject not very long ago, I mentioned to you how singly yet, with how little notice, the vague guesses of that noble Greek had met with confirmation in the late nebula cosmogony. I felt that you could not avoid casting your eyes upwards to the great nebula in Orion, and I certainly expected that you would do so. You did look up, and I was now assured that I had correctly followed your steps. But in that bitter tirade upon Chantilly, which appeared in yesterday's Musée, the satirist, making some disgraceful allusions to the cobbler's change of name upon assuming the buskin, quoted a Latin line about which we have often conversed. I mean the line... Paraditit antiquam litera prima sono. I had told you that this was in reference to Orion, formerly written Urian, and from certain pungencies connected with this explanation, I was aware that you could not have forgotten it. It was clear, therefore, that you would not fail to combine the two ideas of Orion and Chantilly. That you did combine them, I saw, by the character of the smile 
passed over your lips. You thought of the poor cobbler's immolation. So far, you had been stupid at your gate, but now I saw you drew yourself up to full height. I was then sure that you reflected upon the diminutive figure of Chantillet. At this point, I interrupted your meditations to remark that as, in fact, he was a very little fellow, like Chantillet, he would do better at the Theatre des Veritas. Not long after this, we were looking over an evening edition of the Gazette des Tribunes, when the following paragraphs arrested our attention. Extraordinary murders. This morning, around three o'clock, the inhabitants of the Quarter Saint Roche were aroused from sleep by a succession of ter uh, terrific shrieks, issuing apparently from the fourth story of the house in the Rue Morgue, known to be in the sole occupancy of one Madame L'Espanier and her daughter, Mademoiselle Camille L'Espanier. After some delay, occasioned by a fruitless attempt to procure admission in the usual manner, the gateway was broken with a crowbar, and eight or ten of the neighbours entered, accompanied by two gendarmes. By this time the cries had ceased, but as the parties rushed up the first flight of stairs, two or more voices, in angry contention, were distinguished, and seemed to proceed from the upper part of the house. As the second landing was reached, the sounds also had ceased, and everything remained perfectly quiet. The parties spread themselves and hurried from room to room upon arriving at a large back chamber in the fourth story, the door of which, being found locked and the key inside was forced open, a spectacle presented itself which struck everyone present not less with horror than with astonishment. The apartment was in the wildest disorder, the furniture broken and thrown about in all directions. There was only one bedstead, and from this the bed had been removed and thrown into the middle of the floor. On a chair lay a razor besmeared with blood. On the hearth were two or three long and thick tray human hair, also dabbled in blood, and seeming to have been pulled out by the roots. Upon the floor were found four Napoleons. Earring of topaz, three large silver spoons, three smaller of metal d'Alger, and two bags containing nearly 4,000 francs in gold. The drawers of the bureau, which stood in one corner, were open and had been apparently rifled, although many articles still remained in them. A small iron safe was discovered under the bed, not under the bedstead. It was open, with the key still in the door. It had no content beyond a few old letters and other papers of little consequence. Of Madame L'Espanier, no traces here were seen, but an unusual quantity of soot being observed in the fireplace, a search was made in the chimney and, horrible to relate, the corpse of the daughter, head downwards, was dragged therefrom. It having been thus forced up the narrow aperture for a considerable distance, body was quite warm. Upon examining it, many exurations were perceived, no doubt occasioned by the violence with which it had been thrust up and disengaged. Upon the face were many severe scratches, and upon the throat dark bruises, the deep indentations of fingernails, as if the deceased had been throttled to death. After a thorough search, sorry, after a thorough investigation of every portion of the house, without farther discovery, the party made its way into a small paved yard in the rear of the building, where lay the corpse of the old lady, with her throat so entirely cut that upon an attempt to raise her, the head had fell off. The body, as well as the head, was fearfully mutilated, the former so much so as to scarcely retain any semblance of humanity. To this uh, horrible, to this horrible mystery, there is not as yet, we believe, the slightest clue. <laughs> you see, come on, it's come banjo time here. <laughs> Doesn't quite fit with the, mo mo the murder, does it? <laughs> the next day's paper had these additional particulars. The tragedy in the Rue Morgue. Many individuals have been examined in relation to this extraordinary and frightful affair. The word affair has not yet in France that levity of import which it conveys with us now, but nothing whatsoever has transpired to throw light upon it. We give below all the material testimony elicited. Pauline Dubois, 
Londras disposes, disposes, deposes that she had known both the deceased for three years, having watched for them during that period. The old lady and her daughter seemed on good terms, very affectionate towards each other. They were excellent pay, could not speak in regard to their mode or means of living, uh, believed that Madame uh, Lefrau, Lefrau, Madame L'Espanier told fortunes for a living, was reputed to have money put by, never met any persons in the house when she called for the clothes or took them home, was sure that they had no servant in their employ. There appeared to be no furniture in any part of the building except in the fourth story. Pierre Moreau, tobacconist, deposes that he had been in the habit of selling small quantities of tobacco and snuff uh, to Madame L'Espagne for nearly four years. He was born in the neighbourhood and had always resided there. Uh, the deceased and her daughter had always resided there, had always occupied the house in which the corpses were found for more than six years. It was formerly occupied by a jeweller who underlet the, the upper rooms to various persons. The house was the property of the madam. She became dissatisfied with the abuse of the premise by her tenant and moved into them herself, refusing to let any portion. The old lady was childish. Witnesses had seen the daughter for some five or six times during the six years. The two lived an exceedingly retired life. They were reputed to have money. Had, it, had heard it said amongst the neighbours that Madame uh, L'Espagne told fortunes, but did not believe it. Had never seen any person enter the door except the old lady and her daughter, a porter maybe once or twice, and a physician some eight or ten times. Many of the persons, neighbours, gave evidence to the same effect. No one was spoken of as frequenting the house. It was not known whether there were any living connections of Madame uh, L'Espagne and her daughter. The shutters of the front door were seldom opened. Those in the rear were always closed, with the exception of the large back room. Oh, hang on, sorry. Those in the rear were always closed, with the exception of the large back room in the fourth story. The house was a good house, not very old. Isidore Mouzet, a gendarme, deposes that he was called to the house about three o'clock in the morning and found some 20 or 30 people at the gateway endeavouring to gain admittance, forced it open at length with a bayonet, not with a crowbar, um, had but little, little difficulty in getting it open, on account of it being a double or folding gate and bolted neither at the top nor the bottom. The shrieks were continuing until the gate was forced and then suddenly ceased. And in doing that, I've lost my place. Where's it gone? <laughs> there seemed to be screams of some person or persons in great agony. These were loud and drawn out, not short and quick. Witnesses uh, led the way up the stairs. Uh, upon reaching the first landing, they heard two voices in loud and angry contention. The one a gruff voice, the other much shriller, a strange voice. I could distinguish some words of the former, which was that of a Frenchman. Oh God, got accents coming again. Was positive that it was not a woman's voice. Could distinguish the words sacré and diable. Spanish. The shrill voice was that of a foreigner. Could not be sure whether it was the voice of a man or of a woman. Could not make out what was said, but believed the language to be Spanish. Oh, well, that was coincidental. The state of the room and of the bodies was described by this witness as we described them yesterday. Henri Duval, a neighbour and by trade a silversmith, deposes that he was one of the party who first entered the house. Corroborates the testimony of Mouzet in general. As soon as they forced an entrance, they reclosed the door to keep out the crowd, which collected very fast, notwithstanding the lateness of the hour. The shrill voice this witness thinks was that of an Italian, eh, va bene, um, was certain it was not French, could not be sure that it was a man's voice. It might have been a woman's. Was not acquainted with the Italian language, could not distinguish the words, but was convinced by the intonation that the speaker was an Italian. He knew the madame and her daughter, he had conversed with both frequently, was sure that the shrill voice was not of either of the deceased. Something, something, Oddenheimer, restaurateur. This witness volunteered his testimony. Not speaking French, he was examined through an interpreter. He is a, a native of Amsterdam. He was passing the house at the time of the shrieks. They lasted for several minutes. 
Uh, thank you, Lewis. Oh, that's better. They lasted for several minutes, probably ten. They were long and loud, very awful and distressing. It was one of those who entered the building. He corroborated the previous evidence in every respect but one. In short, the shrill voice was that of a man, of a Frenchman. Could not distinguish the words uttered. They were loud and quick, unequal, spoken apparently in fear as well as in anger. The voice was harsh, not so much shrill as harsh. Could not call it a shrill voice. The gruff voice said repeatedly, Sacre, Diable, and once, Mon Dieu. Jules Mignot, banker of the firm of Mignot and Fille, Rue de Lorient, is the elder Mignot. Uh, Madame Lesmanier had some property, had opened an account with his banking house in the spring of the year, eight years before. He made, made frequent deposits in small sums. Had checked for nothing until the third day before her death, where she took out in person the sum of 4,000 francs. The sum was paid in gold, and the clerk went home with the money. Adolphe de Bon, clerk to Mignot et Filet, um, I'll come back, Reaper, um, deposes that on the day in question, about noon, he accompanied Madame L'Espagne to her residence with the 4,000 francs put up in two bags. On the door being closed, Mademoiselle um, El Espagne uh, appeared and took from his hands one of the bag, whilst the old lady relieved him of the other. He then bowed and departed. I did not see any person in the street at the time. It is a by-street. Very lonely. William Bird, tailor, deposes that he was one of the party who went at the house. He is an Englishman. Clearly the bad guy, therefore, if this is a film. Um, had lived in Paris for two years, was one of the first to ascend the stairs. Heard the voices in contention. The gruff voice was that of a Frenchman. Could make out several words, but cannot remember them all. Heard distinctly. Sacre. And mon Dieu. There was a sound at the moment as if several persons struggling. A scraping and scuffling sound. The shrill voice was very loud. Louder than the gruff one. Is sure that it was not the voice of an Englishman. Appeared to be that of a German. Might have been a woman's voice. But does not understand German. Four of the above-named witnesses being recalled deposed that the door of the chambers in which was found the body of Mademoiselle uh, L'Espagne uh, was locked on the inside when the party reached it. Everything was perfectly silent. No groans or noises of any kind. Upon forcing the door, no person was seen. The windows of the back and the front room were down and firmly fastened from within. A door between the two rooms was closed but not locked. The door leading from the front room in the passage was locked with the key on the inside. A small room in the front of the house, on the fourth story at the head of the passage, was open, the door being ajar. This room was crowded with old beds, boxes and so forth. These were carefully removed and searched. There was not an inch of any portion of the house which was not carefully searched. Sweeps were sent up and down the chimneys. The house was a four-storey one with garrets, mansards, a trap door on the roof that was nailed down very securely, did not appear to have been open for years. The time elapsing between the hearing of the voices in contention and the breaking open of the room door was variously stated by the witnesses. Some made it as short as three minutes, some as long as five. The door was opened with difficulty. Alfonso Gocchio, undertaker, deposes that he resides in the Rue Morgue, is a native of Spain, was one of the party who entered the house, but did not proceed up the stairs. He is nervous and was apprehensive of the consequences of agitation. Heard the voices in contention. The gruff voice was that of a Frenchman, could not distinguish what was said. The shrill voice was that of an Englishman. He is sure of this but also does not understand the English language, but judges by the intonation. Alberto Montagny, confectioner, deposes that he was among the first to enter the stairs. There were a lot of people who were the first to enter these stairs, weren't there? Um, heard the voices in question. The gruff voice was that of a Frenchman, distinguished several words. The speaker appeared to be expul... Blimey, what was he doing? The speaker appeared to be... expostulating thing to do on the stairs. Could not make out the words of the shrill voice. Spoke quickly and unevenly. Um, thinks it was the voice of a Russian. Corroborate the general testimony. Is an Italian. Has never conversed with a native of Russia. 
Several witnesses recalled he testifying that the chimneys of all the rooms on the fourth story were too narrow to admit the passage of human being. By sweeps were meant cylindrical sweeping brushes, such as are employed by those who clean chimneys. These brushes were passed up and down every flue in every house. There is no back passage by which anyone could have descended whilst the party proceeded up the stairs. The body of Mademoiselle L'Espanier was so firmly wedged in the chimney that it could not be got down until four or five of the party united their strength. Paul Dumas, physician, deposes that he was called to view the bodies at about break, uh, daybreak. They were both then lying on the sacking of the bedstead in the chamber where the mademoiselle was found. The corpse of the young lady was much bruised uh, and excoriated. The fact that it had been thrust up the chimney would be was sufficiently account for these appearances. The throat was greatly chafed. There were several deep scratches just below the chin, together with a series of livid spots, which were evidently the impression of fingers. The face was fearfully discoloured, and the eyeballs protruded. The tongue had been partially bitten through. A large bruise was discovered upon the pit of the stomach, produced apparently by the pressure of a knee. In the opinion of Mr. Dumas, Mademoiselle L'Espagne had been throttled to death by some person or persons unknown. The corpse of the mother was horribly mutilated. All the bones of the right leg and arm were more or less shattered. The left tibula was splintered, as well as all the ribs of the left side. The whole body was dreadfully bruised and discoloured. It was not possible to say how the injuries had been inflicted. A heavy club or wood or a broad bar of iron, a chair, any large, heavy and obtuse weapon could have produced such results if wielded by the hands of a very powerful man. No woman could have inflicted the blows with any weapon. The head of the deceased, when seen by witnesses, was entirely separated from the body and was also greatly shattered. The throat had evidently been cut with some very sharp implement, possibly with a razor. Alexandra Etinier, a surgeon, was called with Mr. Dumas to view the bodies, corroborated the testimony and the opinions of Mr. Dumas. There we are, folks. Murder mystery. Here we go. Nothing farther of importance was elicited, although several of the persons were examined. A murder so mysterious and so perplexing in all its particulars was never before committed in Paris, if indeed a murder has been committed at all. Police are entirely at fault. An unusual occurrence in affairs of this nature. There is not, however, the shadow of a clue apparent. The evening edition of the paper stated that the greatest excitement still continued in the Quartier Saint Roche, that the premises in question had been carefully researched and fresh examinations of witnesses instituted, but all to no purpose. A postscript, however, mentioned that Adolphe de Bon had been arrested and imprisoned, although nothing appeared to criminate him beyond the facts already detailed. Dupin seemed singularly interested in the progress of this affair, at least so I judged from his manner, for he made no comments. It was only after the announcement that Le Bon had been imprisoned that he asked me my opinion respecting the murders. Hold there for a moment, because even I can tell I need to hydrate. Hold up, where's my... There we are. I uh, hope you're enjoying your, your, your daily dose, Omega. <laughs> so where are we? Are you trying to figure out who it is? I am in my head. I'm trying to work out what earth has happened. Um, so. Where are we? Ah, here we go. So he asked me my opinion respecting the murders. I could merely agree with all Paris in considering them an insoluble mystery. I saw no means by which it would be possible to trace the murderers. Sorry, murderer. Even. We must not judge of the means, said Dupin, by the shell of an examination. The Parisian police, so much extolled for acumen, are cunning, but no more. There is no method in their proceedings beyond the method of the moment. They make a vast parade of measures, but not infrequently. These are so ill-adapted to the objects proposed as to put us in mind of Monsieur Jourdain's calling for his robe de chambre pour mieux entendre la musique. 
come on, I got that in one go. That's <laughs> Accents be down. The results attained by them are not unfrequently surprising, but for the most part are brought about by simple diligence and activity. I pause there. Omega was anticipating me sitting on a couch with a glass of gin next to a fireplace. <laughs> it's, it might still be a bit early, I think, for a, for a glass of gin. Um, it was 12 o'clock somewhere. <laughs> When these qualities are unavailing, their schemes fail. Vidoc, for example, was a good guesser and a, pers a persevering man, but without educated thought, he erred continuously by the very intensity of his investigations. He impaired his visions by holding the object too close. He might see, perhaps, one or two points with unusual clearness, but in so doing, he necess necessarily lost sight of the matter as a whole. Thus, there is such a thing as being too profound. Truth is not always in a well. In fact, as regards the more important knowledge, I do believe that she is invariably superficial. The depth lies in the valleys where we seek her, and not upon the mountaintops where she is found. The modes and sources of this kind of error are well typified in the contemplation of the heavenly bodies. To look at the stars by glances, to view it in a sidelong way, by turning towards it in the exterior proportions of the retina, more susceptible of feeble impressions of light than the interior, is to behold the star distinctly, is to have the best appreciation of its lustre, a lustre which glows dim, just in proportion as we turn our vision fully upon it. A greater number of rays actually fall upon the eye in the latter case, but in the former, there is a more refined capacity for comprehension. By undue profundity, we perplex an feeble thought, and it is possible to make even Venus herself vanish from the firmament by a scrutiny too sustained, too concentrated, or too direct. I thought big armchair with the fire roaring and a red dressing gown <laughs> and a smoking jacket. I think dog at the feet would be close. Um, cats tend to have a tendency to attack me. I don't know why I'm that fond of me. I wouldn't have gone down well in Egypt. As for these murderers... Let us enter into some examinations for ourselves before we make upon an opinion respecting them. An inquiry will afford us um, amusement. I'm lost. Can we start again? <laughs> I tell you what, pause here. What I have gathered so far is that we have got um, an elderly lady and her mother killed within a locked room, seemingly killed, that is. They haven't actually assumed it's murder yet, but the fact that so, what the daughter has been stuffed into a chimney that only um, a chimney sweep's tool could get her in or out of, um, would appear to require either immense force or for her to have dropped from the chimney outside on the roof. But that was, according to all the witnesses, locked uh, and had been locked for many years. The body of the mother was outside in the yard and has clearly been brutalized if her head has been severed from her body. A lot of money has been stolen, of which two bank tellers were well aware. And she lives in a house where you let only the top floor uh, and was the only floor that was furnished, which would suggest that she only occupied or used the fourth, didn't use the first, second or third. Um, we've got two protagonists who were in some kind of dispute or argument, one with a shrill voice, one with a deep one. Uh, we don't know uh, the... Uh, who or where the native speaker came from with the shrill voice as it seemed to swing uh, between, uh, let's just see, Russian, Spanish, English, German. Clearly no one knows where. Um, at some point, maybe do a kid's book for the nieces and other people's children. That's not a good idea. Um, for perhaps a future reflection. Um, so where we are at the moment um, is we do not know. We've got these two intelligent chaps who live a very uh, isolated life, are about to, I think, try to piece together the puzzle through nothing more than the newspaper. So this is a very much Edgar Allan Poe version of Sherlock Holmes, uh, where uh, Holmes and Watson live an incredibly secluded life uh, in a falling down mansion. I think, Lewis, I think that's where we are. Am I close, my love? 
someone knows the outcome of the book. Let's, let's have a look. Where were we? As for these murders, let us entertain into some examinations of ourselves before we make up an opinion respecting them. An inquiry will afford us amusement. I thought this an odd term, so applied, but said nothing more. And, besides, Le Bon once rendered me a service for which I am not ungrateful. We will go and see the premises with our own eyes. I know the prefect of police, and shall have no difficulty in obtaining the necessary permission. The permission was indeed obtained, and we proceeded at once to the Rue Morgue. This is one of those miserable thoroughfares which intervenes between the Rue Richelieu and the Rue saint roche It was late in the afternoon when we reached it. At this quarter, it is a great distance from that with which we resided. The house was readily found, for there were still many persons gazing upon the closed shutters with an objectless curiosity. Uh, from the opposite side of the way, it was an ordinary Parisian house. The gateway, one on, on one side of which was a glazed watchbox, with a sliding panel in the window, indicating a logeur de concierge. Before going in, we walked up the street, turned down an alley, and then again, turning, passed in the rear of the building. Dupin, meanwhile, examining the whole neighbourhood as well as the house, with a minuteness of attention for which I could see no possible object. Retracing our steps, we came again to the front of the dwelling. That rang, and having shown our credentials, were admitted by the agents in charge. We went upstairs, into the chamber where the body of Mademoiselle L'Espanier was being found, and where both the deceased still lay. The disorders of the room had, as usual, been suffered to exist. I saw nothing beyond what had been stated in the Gazette des Tribunaux. Dupin scrutinised everything, not excepting the bodies of the victims. We then went into the other rooms and into the yard of Jandin, accompanying us throughout. Examination uh, occupied us until dark, when we took our departure. On our way home, my companion stepped in for a moment at the offices of one of the daily papers. I have said that the whims of my friend were manifold, and that je le mangeais, for this phrase there is no English equivalent, which does not help me explain in what was just said, ladies and gentlemen. It was his humour now to decline all conversation on the subject of the murder until about noon. The next day, he then asked me suddenly if I had observed anything peculiar at the scene of the atrocity. There was something in his manner of emphasising the word peculiar which caused me to shudder without knowing why. I said, no, nothing peculiar, I said. Nothing more, at least, than we both saw stated in the paper. The Gazette, he replied, has not entered, I fear, into the usual, unusual horror of the thing. But, dismiss the idle opinions of this print, it appears to me that this mystery is considered insoluble for the very reason which should cause it to be regarded as easy of solution, I mean for the author of character of its features. The police are confounded by the seeming absence of motive, not for the murder itself, but for the atrocity of the murder. They are puzzled, too, by the seeming impossibility of reconciling the voices heard in contention with the fact that no one was discovered up the stairs but the assassinated Mademoiselle L'Espanier, and that there were no means of egress without the notice of the parties ascending. The wild disorder of the room, the corpse thrust, with the head downward up the chimney, the frightful mutilation of the body of the old lady, these considerations which those just mentioned, and others which I need not mention, have sufficed to paralyse the powers by putting completely at fault the boasted acumen of the government agents. They have fallen into the gross but common error of confounding the unusual with the abstruse. But it is by these deviations from the plane of the ordinary that reason feels its way, if at all, in its search for the truth. In investigations such as we are now pursuing, it should not be so much asked what has happened, as what has occurred that has never occurred before. In fact, the faculty with which I shall arrive, or have arrived, at the solution of this mystery is in the direct ratio of its apparent insolubility in the eyes of the police. I stared at the speaker in mute astonishment. I am now waiting, continued he, looking towards the door of our apartment, I am now waiting a person who, although perhaps not the perpetrator of these butcheries, must have been in some measure 
implicated in their perpetration. Of the worst proportion of the crimes committed, it is the probable that he is innocent. I hope that I am right in this supposition, for upon it I build my expectation of reading the entire riddle. I look for the man here, in this room, every moment. It is true that he may not arrive, but the probability is that he will. Should he come, it will be necessary to detain him. Here are pistols, <laughs> and, we, like, prepared, and we both know how to use them when the occasion demands their use. I took the pistol, scarcely knowing what I did, or believing what I heard, whilst Dupin went on, very much as in soliloquy. I have already spoken of his abstract manner at several times. His discord was addressed to myself, but his voice, although by no means loud, had the intonation which is commonly employed in speaking to someone at a great distance. His eyes, vacant in expression, regarded only the wall. That the voices heard in contention, he said, by the party upon the stairs were not the voices of the women themselves, was fully proved by the evidence. This relieves us of all doubt upon the question whether the old lady could have first destroyed the daughter and afterwards have committed suicide. I speak of this point chiefly for the sake of method, for the strength of Madame L'Espanier would have been utterly unequal to the task of thrusting her daughter's corpse up a chimney as it was found and the nature of the wounds upon her own person entirely preclude the idea of self-destruction. Murder, then, has been committed by some third party, and the voices of this third party were those uh, heard in contention. Let me now advert, not to the whole testimony respecting the voices, but to what was peculiar in that testimony. Did you observe anything peculiar about it? Is chat lost, or have we got any thoughts? <laughs> I remarked that, whilst all the witnesses agreed in supposing the gruff voice to be that of a Frenchman, there was much disagreement in regards to the shrill, or, as one individual termed it, the harsh voice. That was the evidence itself, said Dupin, but it was not the peculiarity of the evidence. You observed... Observe, hang on. Ooh, ooh, hang on. You who observed nothing distinctive. I'm going to take convict up on that tea soon. You have observed nothing distinctive, yet there was something to be observed. The witnesses, as you remark, agreed about the gruff voice. There here was unanimous. There they were here unanimous. But in regard to the shrill voice, the peculiarity is not that they disagreed, but that whilst an Italian, an Englishman, and a Spanish, a Spaniard, a Hollander, and a Frenchman attempt to describe it, each one spoke of it as that of a foreigner. Each is sure that it was not the voice of one of his own countrymen. Each likens it not to the voice of an individual of any nation with whose language he is conversant, but the converse. The Frenchman supposed it the voice of a Spaniard and might have distinguished some words had he been acquainted with the Spanish. The Dutchman maintains it to have been that of a Frenchman, but we find him stated that, not understanding French, this witness was examined through an interpreter. The, English thinks, the Englishman thinks it's the voice of a German and does not understand German. The Spaniard is sure that it was that of an Englishman, but judges by the intonation altogether, as he has no knowledge of the English. The Italian believed it to be the voice of a Russian, but has never conversed with a native of Russia. A second Frenchman differs, moreover, with the first and is positive that the voice was that of an Italian, but not being cognizant of that tongue, is, like the Spaniard, convinced by the intonation. Now, how strangely unusual must that voice have really been, about which such testimony as this could have been elicited? In whose tongues even denizens of the five great divisions of Europe could recognise nothing familiar? You will say that it might have been the voice of an Asti voice of an Asiatic, of an African. Neither Asiatics nor Africans are abound in Paris. But without denying the inference, I will now merely call your attention to three points. The voice is termed by one witness harsh rather than shrill. It is represented by two others to have been quick and unequal. No words, no sounds resembling words, were by any witness mentioned as distinguishable. 
I know not, continued Dupin, what impression I may have made so far upon your own understanding, but I do not hesitate to say that legitimate deductions, even from this portion of the testimony, the portion respecting the gruff and shrill voices, are, in themselves, sufficient to engender a suspicion which should give direction to all farther progress in the investigation of the mystery. I say legitimate deductions, but my meaning is not thus fully expressed. I designed to imply that the, the deductions are the sole proper ones, and that suspicion arises inevitably from them as a single result. What the suspicion is, however, I will not say just yet. I merely wish you to bear in mind that with myself, it was sufficiently forcible to give a definite form, a certain tendency to my inquiries into the chamber. Well, I don't know about you guys, but so far I'm getting that this... Mrs. Osborne possibly... Is there, is there even two people, I wonder? If the other... If the voice is shrill and indistinguishable and they can't become any words, are they even short to person? As opposed to an animal? I'm getting a big smile from across the room. You're not going to tell me, are you? Until I get, no. Fascinating, this is people. An animal could have done it. Well, animals are very intelligent. Monkeys. <laughs> From a zoo? <laughs> From a a travelling monkey. I don't... <laughs> Let us now transport ourselves in fancy to this chamber. What shall we first seek here? That means of aggress employed by the murderers. It is not too much to say that neither of us believed in preternatural events. Madame and Mademoiselle L'Espagne were not destroyed by the spirits. The doers of the deed were material and escaped materially. Then how? Fortunately, there is but one mode of reasoning upon the point, and that, must, that mode must lead us to a definitive decision. Let us examine, each by each, the possible means of grass. It is clear that the assassins were in the room, where Mademoiselle L'Espagne was found, or at least in the room adjoining, where the party ascended the stairs. It is then only from these two apartments that we have to seek issues. The police have laid bare the floors, the ceilings and the masonry of the wall in every direction. No secret issues could have escaped their vigilance, but, not trusting to their eyes, I examined with my own. There were then no secret issues. Both doors leading from the rooms into the passage were securely locked, with keys inside. Let us turn to the chimneys. These, although of ordinary width for some eight or ten feet above the hearths, will not admit, throughout their extent, the body of a large cat. There perhaps goes the animal idea. The impossibility of aggress, by means already stated, being thus absolute, we are reduced to the windows. Through those of the front room, no one could have escaped without notice from the crowd into the streets. The murderers must have passed then through those of the back room. Now, brought to this conclusion is so unequivocal a manner as we are, it is not our part as reasoners to reject it on account of apparent impossibility. It is only left for us to prove that these apparent impossibilities are, in reality, not such. There are two windows into the chamber. One of them is unobstructed by furniture and is wholly visible. The lower portion of the other is hidden from view by the head of the unwieldy bedstead, which is thrust close up against it. The former was found securely fastened from within. It rest resisted the utmost force from those who endeavoured to raise it. A large gimlet hole had been pierced into its frame to the left, and a very stout nail was found fitted therein, near, nearly to the head. Upon examining the other window, a similar nail was seen similarly fitted into it and a vigorous attempt to raise this sash failed also. The police were now entirely satisfied that aggress had not been in these directions, and, therefore, it was through a matter of supererogation to withdraw the nails and open the windows. My own examination was somewhat more particular, and was so for the reasons I have just given, because here it was, I knew that all apparent impossibilities must be proved to be not such in reality. I proceeded to think thus, a posteriori, 
the murderers did not did escape from one of these windows. This being so, they could not have refastened the sashes from the inside, as they were found fastened. The consideration which put a stop through its obviousness to the scrutiny of the police in this quarter, yet the sashes were fastened. They must then have the power of fastening them themselves. There was no escape from this conclusion. I stepped to the unobstructed casement, withdrew the nail with some difficulty, and attempted to raise the sash. It resisted all my efforts, as I had anticipated. A concealed spring must, I now knew, exist. And this corroboration of my idea convinced me that the premises, at least, were correct. However mysterious still appeared the circumstances attending the nails, a careful search soon brought to light the hidden spring. I pressed it and, satisfied with the discovery, forbore to upraise the sash. Okay, so there's a hidden way in through one of the windows by way of a spring. This is starting to look like someone's help from inside, one of the, either the mademoiselle or the madame. I now replaced the nail and regarded it attentively. A person passing out through this window might have reclosed it and the spring would have caught, but the nail could not have been replaced. The conclusion was plain and again narrowed in the field of my investigations. The assassins must have escaped through the other window. Supposing then that the springs upon each sash to be the same, as was probable, there must be found a difference between the nails or at least between the modes of their fixture. Getting upon the sacking of the bedstead, I looked over the headboard minutely at the second casement. Passing my hand down between the board, I readily discovered and pressed the spring, which was, as I had supposed, identical in character with its neighbour. I now, look, now looked at the nail. It was as stout as the other, and apparently fitted in the same manner, driven in nearly up to the head. You will say that I was puzzled, but if you think so, you must have misunderstood the nature of the inductions. To use a sporting phrase... I had not been once at fault. The scent had never for an instant been lost. There was no flaw in any link of the chain. I had traced the secret to its ultimate result, and that result was the nail. It had, I say, in every respect, the appearance of its fellow in the other window, but this fact was an absolute nullity, conclusive as it might seem to be, when compared with the consideration that here, at this point, terminated the clue. There must be something wrong, I said, about the nail. I touched it, and the head, which was about a quarter of an inch of the shank, came off in my fingers. The rest of the shank was in the gimlet hole, where it had been broken off. The fracture was an old one, for its edges were encrusted with rust and had apparently been accomplished by the blow of a hammer, which had been partially embedded in the top of the bottom sash, the head portion of the nail. Anyone having buffering problems? Or is it just you? I should pause there for a second. Is everyone still with us or are we... It also gives me a moment for more water. I'll just... Uh... I wouldn't mind some more water. I don't think we're going to need the hydrate button here today, folks. Um... No, nope, everyone else all right? I'll pause there for a moment, convict. I'll, um, if you want to refresh, um, so just take a moment. Okay. She's left. Oh, we've got much, no, not much left at all, folks. I think. Oh, whoa, we're nearly, we're nearly going to find out what's happened here. Um, um, anyone got any thoughts? I'm. I'm at the moment, I, I, it's my opinion, I have no idea how this murder has been committed. Um, I think, at the moment, I'm stuck with the mademoiselle in the chimney. I don't know how that's happened. But my thinking is that someone has, one of the two women has betrayed the other. And at the moment, I have a feeling that it's the older lady that the madame has betrayed the mademoiselle. And she has been offed in the, that's very uncouth, has been offed, has been dispatched. Um, <laughs> is that better? Is it better? I've no idea. Thank you, my love. Um, on their way out um, 
of the building in a very brutal fashion. But why you put the lady in the chimney, I don't know. Shall we find out? We are nearly there. We're only a few pages away. Um, so here we are. So we've got basically a false nail um, in one of the windows uh, that's been whacked with a hammer. So it looks like it is solid, but it's not. And there's a spring which can let you open it and close it again uh, from the outside. And indeed, here's the point. Pressing the spring, I gently raised the sash for a few inches. The head went up with it, remaining firm in its bed. I closed the window and the semblance of the whole nail was again perfect. The riddle so far was now unriddled. The assassin had escaped through the window, which looked upon the bed. Dropped of its own accord upon his exit, or perhaps purposely closed, it had become fastened by the spring. And it was the retention of this spring which had been mistaken by the police for that of the nail, further inquiry being thus considered unnecessary. The next question is that of the mode of descent. Upon this point, I had been satisfied in my walk, with you around the building, about five feet and a half from the casement in question, there runs a lightning rod. From this rod it would have been impossible for anyone to reach the window itself, to say nothing of entering it. I observed, however, that the shutters of the fourth story were of the peculiar kind called by Parisian carpenters, ferrades, a kind rarely employed at the present day, but frequently seen upon very old mansions, at Lyon and Bordeaux, they are in the form of an ordinary door, a single, not a folding door, except that the lower half is latticed or worked in open trellis, thus affording an excellent hold for the hands. In the present instance, these shutters are fully three feet and a half broad. When we saw them from the rear of the house, they were both about half open, that is to say, they stood off at right angles from the wall. It is probable that the police, as well as myself, examining the back of the tenement, but in so, if so, in looking at these farads in the line of their breadth, as they must so have done, they did not perceive this great breadth itself, or, at all events, failed to take it into due consideration. In fact, having once been satisfied themselves that no egress could have been made in this quarter, they would naturally bestow here a very cursory, examination. It was clear to me, however, that the shutter belonging to the window at the head of the bed would, if swung fully back to the wall, reach to within two feet of the lightning rod. It was also evident that by exertion of a very unusual degree of activity and courage, that entrance into the window from the rod might have been thus effected. By reaching to the distance of two feet and a half, we now suppose the shutter open to its whole extent. A robber might have taken a firm grasp upon the trellis work, letting go then his hold upon the rod, placing his feet securely against the wall and springing boldly from it, he might have swung the shutter so as to close it. And, if we imagine the window open at the, at the time, might even have swung himself into the room. I wish you to bear especially in mind that I have spoken of a very unusual degree of activity as requisite to succeed in so hazardous and so difficult a feat. It is my design to show you first that thing might possibly have been accomplished, but secondly and chiefly, I wish to impress upon your understanding the very extraordinary, the almost preternatural character of the agility which could have accomplished it. You will say, no doubt, using the language of the law, that uh, to make out my case I should rather undervalue than insist upon a full estimation of the activity required in this manner. Sorry, in this matter. This may be the practice in law, but it is not the usage of reason. My ultimate object is only the truth. My immediate purpose is to lead you to place in juxtaposition that very unusual activity of which I have just spoken with that very peculiar shrill or harsh and unequal voice about whose nationality no two persons could be found to agree and in whose utterance no syllabification could be detected. I'm impressed, I'm to say, syllabification without muddling it up. At these words, a vague and half-formed conception of the meaning of Dupin 
flitted over my mind. I seemed to be upon the verge of comprehension without power to comprehend, as men at times find themselves upon the brink of remembrance without being able in the end to remember. My friend went on with his discourse. You will see, he said, that I have shifted the question from the mode of aggress to that of ingress. It was my design to convey the idea that both were affected in the same manner at the same point. Let us now revert to the interior of the room. Let us survey the appearances here. The drawers of the bureau, it is said, had been rifled. Although, oh, thank you very much, Omega. I got so engrossed, I leant forward. Oh. Thank you, thank you. It was my design, sorry, yeah, ha. the drawers of the bureau, it is said, had been rifled, although many articles of apparel still remained within them. The conclusion here is absurd. It is a mere guess, a very silly one and no more. How are we to know that the articles found in the drawers were not all these drawers had originally contained? Madame L'Espagne and her daughter lived an exceedingly retired life, saw no company, seldom went out, had little use for numerous changes of habillement. Those found were at least uh, of as good a quality as any likely to be possessed by these ladies. If a thief had taken any, why did he simply not take the best? Why did he not take all? In a word, why did he abandon 4,000 francs in gold to encumber himself with a bundle of linen? The gold was abandoned. Nearly the whole sum mentioned by Monsieur Mignon the banker was discovered in bags upon the floor. I wish you, therefore, to discover from your thoughts the blundering idea of motive engendered in the brains of the police by that proportion of the evidence which speaks of money delivered at the door of the house. Hello, Torres Johnson, how are you? You're about to, I think, come to the conclusion of who's committed the murder. You've timed that very well. A big hello to Torres, everybody. Am I reading the Bible? I'm not. This is Edgar Allan Poe. We're starting with that, then a poem, and then we're moving on to some Tolkien, and then a science fiction book. So, you come to us where the gold, 4,000 francs of it, was abandoned um, uh, by a supposed intruder. I wish you, therefore, to discard from your thoughts the blundering idea of motive engendered in the brains of the police by that proportion of the evidence which speaks of money delivered at the door of the house, coincidences ten times as remarkable as this, the delivery of money and murder committed within three days upon the party receiving it, happened to all of us every hour of our lives, without attracting even momentary notice. Coincidences in general are great stumbling blocks in the way of that class of thinkers, Oh, actually, the huh, I've forgotten to plug in um, one of our devices and it's about to run out of battery. Hang on. Oops, it's easy. Hold that thought, everybody. There we go. Ah, and we're back. Yes, the science fiction is Red Rising, Torres. And I hope you're all enjoying yourself. Or selves, plural. I hope this is enjoyable for you. I'm certainly enjoying it. I want to know who's committed the murder. Um, at one point, I wondered if it was an animal. And that's clearly going out the window. As I, I wondered whether or not it was an aggressive monkey. Um, it does not appear to be an aggressive monkey. Why do we have so many books? We love books. We're just a um, massive fan of books. We've got gardening books, we've got intellectual books, um, we've got less intellectual books. I'd, uh, I, I can um, only offer, if I just have a pause, I can only invite you to guess whose are the intellectual books, whose are the less intellectual books. <laughs> um, yes, Taurus, absolutely love reading a good book. In fact, only because they were hard to get a hold of, the rest of them are going to be on uh, Kindle, um, which I think is a lovely thing to have. Um, so I'm thoroughly enjoying this, and that's why I say I hope everyone else is too, because I'm basically getting to sit here and read um, an enjoyable book. Um, and Mrs. Allen knows what's about to happen in the end, 
Um, I don't. I haven't got a clue. Um, and I'm trying to work it out as we go along. Has anybody got any thoughts? I'm starting to now think acrobat. Um, <laughs> it's not an acrobat, is it? <laughs> I, yes, I'm, I'm starting to think acrobat. Um, because, I tell you what, Taurus, you've just joined. We're at the point where we've got two people who have been killed with apparently no way in and out. The very in in intellectual recluse has figured out that one of the windows at the head of the bed um, had a nail in it that made it look like it was bolted in, but it had been sabotaged. So um, it only had the nail head in but the rest of it was broken and there was a spring of release. Um, goodness gracious, Falama, thank you very much for subscribing. Don't be sorry about the late, late appearance. Um, you can welcome any time you like for five minutes, five hours, whenever you choose. You're always welcome here. And thank you so much for the subscription. Everyone, massive hello and show some here. Massive love to Falama for that, a marvellous duo. Uh, welcome on in. In fact, since we've got more people joining, I shall tell you where we're up to. Take a moment and just recap. Are we doing a five hour stream? <laughs> well, it's interesting you should say that. There's, um, let's talk about that again at the end of the stream, shall we, or in time to come. Um, where we are is we've got two reclusive French ladies, uh, a madame and a mademoiselle, um, have been found uh, dead inside a locked room. Um, with the front door locked, the back door locked, skipping through some of the clues here, because uh, we're, we're getting to the point where we're nearly going to work this out. The oddities and the evidence which our protagonists have said to us, let us forget these, otherwise you'll get distracted. The Mademoiselle is stuffed in a chimney, um, which no one can get in or out of, and required five people to pull them out of, uh, and couldn't even fit a cat. The, the madame was found dead outside, decapitated, uh, in fact, nearly decapitated, strictly speaking. The book said that when they took, went to move her, her head fell off. Um, fairly unpleasant. Uh, there was a seeming... Um, no worries, comment. You, you, you come, go, lurk as you please, uh, and do pass on to Kitten, my very best, for uh, um, her stream at... Um, uh, oh, at five, sorry. Yes. Well, if we're still going at five, if, we, if you guys have all stuck me out till then, you must give her our best when you, when you go. So we've got two, two dead individuals. Two protagonists are heard. Um, one speaking French. Another, a language which our protagonist has worked out no one can pin down, uh, save to say that they all say it's a different language and takes the reasoning that it's none of those. Um, and it's not a European language. It's not an African language. Um, uh, or an Aztec language. Um, he's discovered that one of the windows can be opened. Um, he worked out that the, the murderer could get in um, by way of a lightning rod and an open uh, shutter and has pointed out the fairly obvious fact that the police made a mistake saying that the drawers were rifled uh, and that we've just reached the point of him saying, well, why on earth would you rifle the drawers of two reclusive French ladies um, and leave 4,000 francs um, in the room because there was four, well, basically, uh, the four grand, four French grand is lying on the floor, um, not even taken. Um, and has made the, the, the perhaps clever point here that actually if you're a recluse, um, why would it matter to have your drawers in a neat state of affairs? Have they been rifled at all? Or I suppose you know, take current time, climate, you know, if you, you, you just, you're not going in or out of your home because of COVID, you know, maybe your drawers will not look immaculate and pristine and maybe someone would come in and go, someone has rifled them. Well, no, it's just, I'm just doing my own thing. I'm kicking my heels. So there we are. I've, I've no idea. I'm, I'm now on Acrobat, which is uh, has changed from monkey. A, a, attack monkey was embarrassing one of my first thoughts. Um, but both of those have got a grin from Mrs. Owl, who knows how this plays out. Um, but it's the fact they've left the money seems odd. Or, here's a thought for a cam reading, are they wrong about both voices? Could it be that the madame had a gruff voice and what they've heard is a simple burglar 
No, that doesn't work either because you still have a mademoiselle stuffed in a chimney. It's the mademoiselle stuffed in the chimney. I hope that gets explained. It better get explained. Have another sip of water and then we shall, we shall carry on. Um, and Convict has already redeemed me a pot of tea, so we'll, we'll have that after this book. Maybe I'll make Mrs. Owl a coffee at the same time. Maybe we'll go over to the coffee station, all of us, and we'll, um, we'll make some coffee and some tea. Would you like a mocha, my love? Or a cup of coffee? I like it. Omega has given me more hydrate. I do need more hydrate. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just more and more. Just keep drinking that. Mm. We're not sponsored by Chili's bottles, by the way, but I can say they are really good. Um, <laughs> thank you, my man. And before we carry on, actually, again, a huge congratulation um, to Omega for his stream last night, which was immense fun and clearly went very well indeed. How much did you end up drinking last night, Omega? <laughs> do, do, do you remember how many shots you ended up going through? What's the bit? It seemed to be an impressive quantity. It, I just get the answer, lol. <laughs> Should go back through your stream and count for you. So where were we? Right. Um, dum, 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 dum. Here we go. Yes, a point. Um, you drank half a litre. <laughs> wow. Um, I must say, Flamma, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to trying Among Us as well. It does look uh, marvellous fun. That might happen this weekend coming. Uh, I can either confirm or deny. I shall work that out. But back to the Rue Morgue. Um, so as he point, as our protagonist Dupin points out, the gold, the 4,000 francs, was abandoned. Nearly the whole sum mentioned by Monsieur Mignon, the banker, was discovered in bags upon the floor. I wish you, therefore, to discard from your thoughts the blundering idea of motive, gendered in the brains of the police by that proportion of the evidence which speaks of money delivered at the door of the house. Coincidences ten times as remarkable as this Delivery of money, a murder committed within three days upon the party receiving, happened to us all, every hour of our lives, without uh, attracting even momentary notice. Do they really? Murders? Coincidences in general are great stumbling blocks in the way of that class of thinkers who have been educated to know nothing of the theories of probabilities, that the theory to which the most glorious objects of human research are indebted for the most glorious of illustration. In the present instance, had the gold been gone, the fact of its delivery three days before would have formed something more than a coincidence. It would have been corroborative of the idea of motive. But, under the real circumstances of the case, if we are to suppose gold the motive of this outrage, we must also imagine the perpetrator so vacillating an idiot as to have abandoned his gold and his motive altogether. Keeping now steadily in mind the points to which I have drawn your attention, that peculiar voice, that unusual agility, and that startling absence of motive in a murder so singularly atrocious as this, let us glance at the butchery itself. Here is a woman strangled to death by manual strength and thrust up a chimney, head downward, Ordinary assassins employ no such modes of murder as this. Least of all do they dispose um, of the murdered. In the manner of thrusting the corpse up the chimney, you will admit that there was something excessively outre, something altogether irre irreconcilable with our common notions of human action. Even when we suppose the actors the most depraved of men. Think, too, how great must have been that strength which could have thrust the body up such an aperture so forcibly that united vigour of several persons was found barely sufficient to drag it down. Turn now to the other indications of the employment of a vigour most marvellous. On the hearth were thick tresses, very thick tresses, of grey human hair. These had been torn uh, out by the roots. You are aware of the great force necessary in tearing thus from the head even twenty or thirty hairs together. 
You saw the locks in question, as well as myself. Their roots, a hideous sight, were clotted with fragments of the flesh of the scalp, sure tokens of the prodigious power which had been exerted in uprooting perhaps half a million of hairs at a time. I'm swinging back to monkey again, you know. Um, the throat swinging of... Back. Swing... <laughs> I'm also proving why I'm not a secret agent in one of my um, one of my perpetrators is potentially a, a, a monkey or a gorilla. The throat of the old lady was not merely cut, but the head absolutely severed from the body. The instrument was a mere razor. I wish you also to look at the brutal ferocity of these deeds. Of the bruises upon the body of Madame L'Espagne, I do not speak. Monsieur Dumas and his worthy co-adjudicator, Monsieur Etienne, have pronounced that they were inflicted by some obtuse instruments. And so far, these gentlemen are very correct. The obtuse instrument was clearly the stone pavement in the yard upon which the victim had fallen from the window, which looked in upon the bed. This idea, however simple it may now seem, escaped the police for the same reason that the breadth of the shutters escaped them, because, by the affair of the nails... Their perceptions had been hermetically sealed against the possibility of the windows having been ever opened at all. If now, in addition to all these things, you have properly reflected upon the odd disorder of the chamber, we have gone so far as to combine the ideas of an agility outstanding, a strength superhuman, a ferocity brutal, a butch butchery without motive, a grotesquerie in horror absolutely alien from humanity, and a voice foreign in tone to the ears of men of many nations, and, to, and devoid of all distinct or intelligible syllabification. What result then has ensued? What impression have I made upon your fancy? I felt a creeping of the flesh as Dupin asked me the question, a madman, I said, has done this deed. Some raving maniac escaped from a neighbouring maison de Sainte. In some respects, he replied, your idea is not irrelevant, but the voices of madmen, even in their wildest, blimey, in their wildest paroxysms, are never found to tally with that peculiar voice heard upon the stairs. Madmen are of some nation, and their language, however incoherent in words, has always the coherence of syllabification. Besides, the hairs of ma besides, the hair of a madman is not such as I now hold in my hand. I disentangled this little tuft from the rigidly clutched fingers of Madame L'Espagne. Tell me what you can make of it. Dupin, I said, completely unnerved. This hair is most unusual. This is no human hair. I have not asserted that it is, he said, but before we decide this point, I wish you to glance at the little sketch I have here traced upon this paper. It is a facsimile drawing of what has been described in one portion of the testimony as dark bruises and deep indentations of fingernails upon the throat of Mademoiselle L'Espagne, and in another by Messrs. Dumas and Etienne, as a series of livid spots, evidently the impression of fingers. You will perceive, continued my friend, spreading out the paper upon the table before us, and that this drawing gives the idea of a of a retained, possibly until the death of the victim, fearful grasp by which it originally embedded itself. Attempt now to place all your fingers at the same time in the respective impressions as you see them. I made the attempt in vain. We are possibly not giving this matter a fair trial, he said. The paper is spread out upon a plain surface, but the human throat is cylindrical. Here is a billet of wood, the circumference of which is about that of a throat. Wrap the drawing around it and try the experiment again. I did so, but the difficulty was even more obvious than before. This, I said, is the mark of no human hand. Read now, replied Dupin, this passage from Cuvier. This was a minute anatomical and generally descriptive account of the large fulvos orangu... of the large... Fulvus Orangu o Utang of the East Indian Islands. This gigantic stature, the prodigious strength and activity, the wild ferocity and the imitative, imitative propensities of these mammalia are sufficiently well known to all. I understand the full horrors of the murder at once. Did I get it right? 
Mrs. Owl is now grinning. Oh, don't tell me I got this right in the first few minutes. The description of the digit, said I, as I made an end of reading, is in exact accordance with this drawing. I see that no animal but an orang of an orang utang of the species here mentioned could have impressed the indentations if you have traced them. This tuft of tawny hair, too, is identical in character with that of the beast of Cuvier, but I cannot possibly comprehend the particulars of this frightful mystery. Besides, there were two voices heard in contention, and one of them was unquestionably the voice of a Frenchman. True. And you will remember an expression attributed almost unanimously by the evidence to this voice. The expression, mon dieu! <clears throat> this, under the circumstances, has been justly characterised by one of the witnesses, Montani, uh, the confectioner, as an expression of remonstrance or expostulation. Upon these two words, therefore, I have mainly built my hopes of a full solution of the riddle. A Frenchman was cognizant of the murder. It is possible, indeed it is far more than probable, that he was innocent of all participation in the bloody transactions which took place. The orangutan may have escaped him, escaped from him. He may have traced it to the chamber, but under the agitated circumstances which ensued, he could never have recaptured it. It is still at large. I will not pursue these guesses, for I have no right to call them more, since the shades of reflection upon which they are based are scarcely of sufficient depth to be appreciably by my own intellect. And since I could not pretend to make them intelligible to the understanding of another, we will call them guesses, then, and speak of them as such. If the Frenchman in question is indeed, as I suppose, innocent of this atrocity, this advertisement, which I left last night upon our return home at the office of Le Mans, a paper devoted to the shipping interest and much sought by sailors, will bring him to our residence. He handed me a paper, and I read thus. Caught in the Bois de Boulogne, early in the morning of the... the morning of the murder, a very large tawny orangutan of the Bornese species. The owner, who is ascertained to be a sailor, belonging to a Maltese vessel, may have uh, the animal again upon identifying it satisfactorily, and paying a few charges arising from its capture and keeping, calling at the uh, Faubourg de Saint-Germain or Trosimé. How was it possible, I asked, that you should know the man to be a sailor and belonging to a Maltese vessel? I do not know it, said Dupin. I am not sure of it. Here, however, is a small piece of ribbon which from its form and from its greasy appearance has evidently been used in the tying, in tying the hair in one of those long queues of which sailors are so fond. Moreover, this knot is one which a few besides sailors can tie, and is peculiar to the Maltese. I picked the ribbon up at the foot of the lightning rod. It could not have belonged to either of the deceased. No, if, after all, I am wrong in my induction from this ribbon that the Frenchman was a sailor belonging to a Maltese vessel, still I can have done no harm in saying what I did in the, uh, in the advertisement. If I am in error, he will merely suppose that I have been misled by some circumstance into which he will not take the trouble to inquire. But if I am right, a great point is gained. Cognizant, although innocent, of the murder, the Frenchman will naturally hesitate about replying to the advertisement, about demanding the orangutan. He will reason thus, I am innocent. I am poor. My orangutan is of great value. To one in my circumstance, a fortune of itself, why should I lose it through idle apprehensions of danger? Here it is, within my grasp. It was found in the Bois de Boulogne, at a vast distance from the scene of that butchery. How could it ever be suspected that a brute beast should have done the deed? The police are at fault. They have failed to procure the slightest clue. Should they even trace the animal, it would be impossible to prove me cognizant of the murder, or to implicate me in the guilt on account of that cognizance. After all, I am known. The advertiser designates me as the possessor of the beast. I am not sure to what limit his knowledge may extend. Should I avoid claiming a property of so great value, which it is known that I possess, I will render the animal at least liable to suspicion. It is not my policy to draw attention either to myself or the beast. I will answer the advertisement. Get the orangutan and keep it close until this matter has blown over. At this moment, we hear a step upon the stairs. Be ready, 
says Dupin, with your pistols, but neither use them nor show them until a signal from myself. The front door of the house had been left open, and that a visitor had entered without ringing and advanced several steps upon the staircase. Now, however, he seemed to hesitate. Presently, we heard him descending. Dupin was moving quickly to the door when we again heard him coming up. He did not turn back a second time, but stepped up with decision and rapped at the door of our chamber. Come in, said Dupin in a cheerful and hearty tone. A man entered. He was a sailor, evidently a tall, stout and muscular looking person with a certain daredevil expression of countenance, not altogether unprepossessing. Uh, His face, greatly sunburnt, was more than half hidden by whisker and mustachio. He had with him a huge oaken cudgel, but appeared to be otherwise unarmed. He bowed awkwardly, bade us good evening, in French accents, which although somewhat uh, nous forchons ish, were still sufficiently indicative of a Parisian origin. Sit down, my friend, said Dupin. I suppose you have called about the orangutan. Upon my word, I almost envy you the possession of him. A remarkably fine, and no doubt a very valuable animal. How old do you suppose him to be? The sailor drew a long breath, with the air of a man relieved of some intolerable burden, and then replied in a short tone. I have no way of telling, but he can't be more than four or five years old. Have you got him here? Oh, no, we had no conveniences for keeping him here. He is a delivery stable in the Rue du Bois, just by. You can get him in the morning. Of course you are prepared to identify the property. To be sure I am, sir. I shall be sorry to part with him, said Dupin. I don't mean that you should uh, be at all uh, this trouble for nothing, sir, said the man. Couldn't expect it. I'm very willing to pay a reward for the finding of the animal. Uh, that is to say, anything in reason. Well, replied my friend, that is all very fair, to be sure. Let me think, what should I have? Oh, I will tell you. My reward shall be this. You shall give me all the information in your power about these murders in the Rue Morgue. Dupin said the last words in a very low tone and very quietly. Just as quietly, too, he walked towards the door, locked it and put the key in his pocket. He then drew a pistol from his bosom and placed it, without the least flurry, upon the table. The sailor's face flushed up as if he were struggling with suffocation. He started to his feet and grasped his cudgel, but the next moment he fell back into his seat, trembling violently and with the countenance of death itself. He spoke not a word. I pitied him from the bottom of my heart. My friend said Dupin in a kind tone. You are alarming yourself unnecessarily. You are indeed. We mean you no harm whatsoever. I pledge you the honour of a gentleman and of a Frenchman that we intend you no injury. I perfectly well know that you are innocent of the atrocities in the Rue Morgue. It will not do, however, to deny that you are in some measure implicated in them. From what I have already said, you must know that I have had means of information about this matter, means of which you could never have dreamed. Now the thing stands thus. You have done nothing which you could have avoided. Nothing, certainly, which renders you culpable. You were not even guilty of robbery, when you might have robbed with impunity. You have nothing to conceal. You have no reason for concealment on the other hand. You are bound by every principle of honour to confess all you know. An innocent man is now imprisoned, charged with that crime of which you can point out to the perpetrator. The sailor had recovered his presence of mind in a great measure whilst Dupin uttered these words, but his original boldness of bearing was all gone. So help me God, he said, after a brief pause, I will tell you all I know about this affair, but I do not expect you to believe one half I say. I would be a fool indeed if I did. Still, I am innocent, and I will make a clean breast if I die for this. What he stated was, in substance, this. He had lately made a voyage to the Indian archipelago. Oops, hang on. Archipelago. Archipelago, thank you. <laughs> a party of which he formed uh, one landed at Borneo and passed into the interior, 
on an excursion of pleasure, himself and a companion had captured an orangutan. This companion dying, the animal fell into his own exclusive possession after great trouble occasioned by the intractable ferocity of his capture during the voyage home, he at length succeeded in lodging it safely at his own residence in Paris, where, not to attract toward himself the unpleasant curiosity of his neighbours, he kept it carefully secluded, until such time as it should recover from a wound in the foot, received from a, a splinter on board ship. His ultimate design was to sell it. Returning home from some sailor's frolic the night, or rather in the morning of the murder, he found the beast occupying his own bedroom, into which it had broken from a closet adjoining, where it had been, as was thought, securely confined. Razor in hand and fully lathered, it was sitting before a looking-glass, attempting the operation of shaving, in which it had no doubt previously watched its master through the keyhole of the closet, terrified at the sight of so dangerous a weapon in the possession of an animal so ferocious, and so well able to use it, the man, for some moments, was at a loss as to what to do. He had been accustomed, however, to quiet the creature, even in its fiercest moods, by the use of a whip, and to this he now resorted. Upon sight of it, the orangutan sprang at once through the door of the chambers, down into the street, and thence through a window, unfortunately open, into the street. The Frenchman followed in despair, the ape, razor still in hand, occasionally stopping to look back, and gesticulating at its pursuer until the latter had nearly come up with him. It then made off again. In this manner the chase continued for a long time. The streets were profoundly quiet, so it was nearly three o'clock in the morning. It passed down an alley into the rear of the Rue Morgue. The fugitive's attention was arrested by a light gleaming from the open window of Madame L'Espagne's chamber in the fourth story of, the, of her house. Rushing, rushing to the building, perceived the lightning rod, clambered up with inconceivable agility, grasped the shutter, which was fully thrown back against the wall, and by its means swung itself directly upon the headboard of the bed. The whole feat did not occupy a minute. The shutter was kicked open again by the orangutan as it entered the room. The sailor, in the meantime, was both rejoiced and perplexed. He had strong hopes of now recapturing the brute, as it could scarcely escape from the trap into which it had ventured, except by the rod, where it might be intercepted as it came down. On the other hand, there was much cause for anxiety as to what it might do in the house. This latter reflection urged the man still to follow the fugitive. A lightning rod is ascended without difficulty, especially by a sailor, but when he had arrived as high as the window which lay far to his left, his career was stopped. The most that he could accomplish was to reach over so as to obtain a glimpse of the interior of the room. At this glimpse he nearly fell from his hold through excess of horror. Now it was that those hideous shrieks arose upon the night which had startled from slumber the inmates of the Rue Morgue. Madame L'Espagne and her daughter, habited in their night clothes, had apparently been occupied in arranging some papers in the middle of the room. It was open, and its contents lay beside it on the floor. The victims must have been sitting with their backs towards the window, and from the time elapsing between the ingress of the beast and the screams, it seems probable that this it was not immediately perceived. The flapping to of the shutter would naturally have been attributed to the wind. As the sailor looked in, the gigantic animal had seized, seized Madame L'Espagne by the hair, which was loose as she had been combing it, and was flourishing the razor about her face in imitation of the motions of a barber. The daughter lay prostrate and motionless, she had swooned. The screams and struggles of the old lady during which the hair was torn from her head had the effect of changing the probably pacific purposes of the orangutan into those of wrath. With one determined sweep of its muscular arm, it nearly severed her head from her body. The sight of blood inflamed its anger into frenzy. Gnashing its teeth and flashing fire from its eyes, it flew upon the body of the girl and embedded its fearful talons into her throat, retaining its grasp until she expired. Its wandering and wild glances fell at this moment upon the head of the bed over which the face of its master, rigid with horror, was just discernible. Fury of the beast, who no doubt bore still in mind the dreaded whip which was instantly converted into fear. Conscious of having deserved punishment, it seemed desirous of concealing its bloody deeds and skipped about the chambers in an agony of nervous agitation, throwing down and breaking furniture as it moved and dragging the bed from the bedstead in conclusion. It seized first the corpse of the daughter and thrust it up the chimney as it was found. 
than that of the old lady which it immediately hurled through the window headlong. As the ape approached the casement with its mutilated burden, the sailor shrank aghast to the rod, and, rather gliding than clambering down it, hurried at once home, dreading the consequences of the butchery, and gladly abandoning in his terror all solicitude about the fate of the orangutan. The words heard by the party upon the staircase were the Frenchman's exclamations of horror and affright, commingling with the fiendish jabberings of the brute. I have scarcely anything to add. The orangutan must have escaped from the chamber by the rod just before the breaking of the door. It must have closed the window as it passed through it. It was subsequently caught by the owner himself, who obtained for it a very large sum, the Jardin des Plantes. Le Bon was instantly released upon our narration of the circumstances, with some comments from Dupin, at the bureau of the prefect of police. This functionary, however, well disposed to my friend, could not altogether conceal his chagrin at the turn which affairs had taken, and was fain to indulge in a sarcasm or two about the propriety of every person minding his own business. Let him talk, said Dupin, who had not thought it necessary to reply. Let him discourse. It will ease his conscience. I am satisfied with having defeated him in his own castle. Nevertheless, that he failed in the solution of this mystery is by no other means that matter for wonder which he supposes it. For, in truth, our friend the prefect is somewhat too cunning to be profound. In his wisdom is no stomach. It is all head and no body like the pictures of the goddess Laverna, or at best, all head and shoulders, like a codfish. But he is a good creature after all. I like him especially for one master stroke of cant by which he has obtained in his reputation for ingenuity. I mean the way that he has d'anier ce qui est, et de l'expliquer ce qui n'est pas. Who knew I guessed it in the first time? Hello, Fox. How are you? Ladies and gentlemen, that was the mystery of the murder of the Rue Morgue. I like that. Murders in the Rue Morgue. How are you, Fox? How is your day going? I hope everybody enjoyed that. I, um, I, I promise I've never read that before. Monkey was genuinely um, a, a wild guess. Um, perhaps point, proving the point in the book uh, that wild guesses are not those of the great intellectual. Stumbled upon it by accident. <laughs> I tell you what, last the, I, what I will do is I shall do the very last um, section for Mrs. L. Um, her last request was a poem. We shall make some tea, a brief excerpt from Tolkien, and then we shall do the start of uh, Fox's request of Red Rising. And then we shall just have a chat about things to come in October. Assuming everybody's happy with that and everyone's still enjoying themselves. Here we are. In fact, let's do this the other way around. I'm sure Mrs. Al, Mrs. Al just popped out for a minute. I think maybe... How, how should, we, should we have a tea and coffee break, folks? Shall I take you with me? Um, and let's make some tea and some coffee. I don't think anyone's uh, actually seen the coffee machine before. Whoops, Daisy. Off we go, folks. Half asleep, enjoying the readings. Oh, good, Fox. I'm glad you're enjoying them. We're going to make some tea. We're going to make some coffee. And maybe even get some cake. Why not? Uh, I don't know if there's anyone not actually seen the coffee machine before, but here we go. So make coffee. do that so I can still see the chat. <laughs> yes, this is uh, extra content viewing here. This is coffee machine stream now. He says, go on, work. Oh. We don't need more beans. Oh, so busy. Oh. Yes, I'm, yeah, be careful of reflection. Yes, I'm keeping my head well up here. <laughs> so, let's clear out the teapot. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, and as Falama said, I'm not teasing, but we shall we shall talk a little more about whether or about some plans for the rest of the month um, in due course. Oh yes, of course, there might be reflections here as well, so it'll keep a high head. Um, right. And this is courtesy of Convict, who uh, redeemed a tea break very early on, um, and I've not actually taken advantage of it yet. Um, you know what, I, I bought this genuinely at the start of the, the lockdown period in March because I just thought, well, we're going to enjoy good coffee even if nothing else uh, will avail us. Um, it's one of the best investments we've put in the kitchen, actually. That and this, which is a burr grinder, which properly grinds your coffee. Um, your coffee beans, rather. So I've already got some pre-ground for some this morning, so we'll just take the lid off. I might even give myself a small espresso. I shall, oh, we'll go out and treat myself, why not? So, pop that in there. If, if you're interested, I'll send you a link, Omega. It does make fantastic coffee, this. Um, what tea shall we have? Um, what have we got? Let's have a look. Oops, Daisy. What do we fancy? I think I planned on bonfire. Ah, yes, bonfire tea. This is tea courtesy of a tip given by Fox. So we're going to have some uh, the bonfire tea that we had last time. Um, oh, hang on. I'm going to turn it. I'm going to turn you this way now because Mrs. Al's going to sit down and do some art. So we shall... No, I don't think it's going to Do you know not? No? Yeah? Oh. I can't quite believe I actually guessed monkey so early on. I know. Who would like to get that? But the thing is, what's worse is I actually made the point in the book about being intelligent and working things out and those people that just do it by guesswork. And that's exactly what I did. I was one of the people that did it by guesswork. They just went for brutal strength um, and inhumanity and said monkey. It was actually a bit devoid of any actual kind of... Detective work. Detective work. I'm not a spy, folks. I'm not a spy. Um, so that, that's my little espresso. So I'm going to have that and some tea. Um, do you want any cake or a biscuit or anything? No? Just a coffee? I thought you were making me a mocha. Mocha? Well, absolutely. Okay, this is now turned into book reading and <laughs> coffee making stream. Um, so, to make yourself a mocha, um, or it, it works better with real milk, but we don't really have milk generally. Um, we do almond milk. So, all it really is, is a shot of espresso. Oh, you won't want it in this cup, will you? No. want it in a different one. Uh, I'm doing, I waited, I'm going to do your poem. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like I've monopolised a lot of the time. Yes, but without the stream, without you, the streams wouldn't happen. Yeah. So this is yeah, my, no, this is my, this is, is my ode to, to you. <laughs> do you. Do you want me to do your private reading? No, I could read the Raven myself. You, you could really, to be fair. Uh, the Raven won't take a, a, as much time as the, uh, as the full read. Bad. Don't feel bad. I mean, this is my, my, my ode to you. The streams wouldn't happen without your help. So, so it's really nice because I got yes, that, that was really for, for for Mrs. Al. My thank you. Um, and we're having tea courtesy of a tip from um, Fox. We haven't even got to the rest of the teas yet, Fox. I'll have to tell you next time we'll do a brewing stream. Um, but I really like the bonfire, so I wanted to have it again. Um, private readings, there's people watching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think, didn't we say that in one suit? It'd be the weirdest OnlyFans ever, just me in a chair reading people's seductive readings or something. Um, I think I can only imagine someone tuning, logging into it and going, this isn't what I paid for, what is this? It's a man dressed like a lumberjack reading poetry to me. With slippers on. Um, 
So, just a couple of... <laughs> Phoenix says I need to do it. <laughs> Could you imagine? Actually, I think I'd get done for trading standards, wouldn't it? If I set something up, say, oh, it's an OnlyFans, you know, seductive talking to you, um, and then it's me in a chair. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear me imagine some disgruntled men tuning in going what the hell is this <laughs> oh but that's it I need to have a 50 shades of gravy chat with Redeem <laughs> oh dear me so oops sorry the noise will get a bit loud for a second hang on That was just me steaming the, uh, the coffee machine. Get the pipes warm. And now we're just gonna throff our milk. So this will be a bit loud for a second, folks. So I'm just frothing together the milk, the espresso shot. Oh, have you? This is Alice coming to show me some art, hang on. That is very cool. That is so cool. Is that going to be going on Instagram? Ah. Mrs. L is doing ink toe at the moment. She's just showing me one of her drawings. Um, so there we go, that's the deafening noise over. And then a tip I picked up from a coffee mate, uh, a barista in Venice. If you tip your drink from one to the other, it will increase the chances of basically, well with real milk anyway, the lipids will stay together better. Um, so I transferred it from one to the other. Little tap. Honestly, the, the batch of, uh, of almond milk I've got recently, it's not frothing very well at all. But nevertheless, then you end up with what is effectively a hot chocolate with a shot of espresso in it. Um, but with real milk, it ha takes on a kind of a different, a different flavor, which I particularly like. So, let me just take that to me. Would you like a lotus biscuit or anything? Can you, um, can you not talk for me literally just a couple of seconds? Okay, you can talk. I can talk again. I can talk again. Um, so I'm going to have my espresso before we go over. Oh, I'm going to have some out of the nice china. Is it down there? The cups? Yeah. Yeah. Unless it, what, what drink is it? Espresso gone. There we go. What, uh, tea. For tea, yeah, yeah. The tea. cups are in there. And then the plates, in all likelihood, no, it's the other side. Oh, that's right. In all likelihood, if it was one of the really nice plates, the plates will be where the plates are. Yes. Lovely jubbly. There we go. There's always a good break for tea. You see, when you redeem chat points for a cup of tea, you really, really get a cup of tea, mate. Um, since we're British, let's break out the china, shall we? How about that? How's the brewing gone of the bonfire tea? There we are. Right, let's toddle back over and let's carry on reading. There we go. Thank you very much for Convict for redeeming a cup of tea time. It's very good of you. Do, 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 do. I like as well that I've got the laptop on here just so that I can see chat easy. Whoops, a daisy. Nearly knocked the phone out. That would have been problematic. Oops, so easy. There we go. Oh, I did a new um, frame background, do you want to see? Oh, did you? Yeah, I finished it. Cool. Sorry to interrupt you. No, it's all right. We're just getting settled back in again for the next bit of the oh, chat. That's all I finished him. Oh, I love him. So I'll pop it for a second. 
And then this is the one that I'm going to have to redraw. That's amazing. What are you redrawing that for? Because I can't draw faces, so I need to, so I, I need to redraw it, <laughs> basically. But yeah, this, so this is a basic idea. But you know, like when women wear this floppy hat? Yeah. So I'm going to have it as like, I'm going to do it like that instead. So then I can just cover her face. I think that's very cool, though. Do you like the idea? I really like the idea. Okay. Folks, th th there shall be some art on Cutie Pie Craft Creations um, in the coming weeks that I employ you to go and look at because it's very cool. And then, this is the... I love that. Do you like it? Yeah. He said, I'm going to put that on my phone background so I can test it. Okay, I'll forward it to you. Here we go. Right. This needs like your best thesp voice. I think. This needs a thesp voice, does it? I right. think so. I don't know. Like, see how you feel. But I feel like. Right. Okay. right. For those of you who have stuck it out through tea making time and coffee making time, we're on to our our brief poem. You need to one up the Simpsons because the Simpsons did this in an episode. Do you remember? I don't remember. Oh, okay. Um, you will once you start reading. I shall do my very best, but this is my, well, my last one for Mrs. Al, a poem that she enjoys. It is called uh, The Raven. Once upon a midnight dreary, whilst I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered. Chap tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow, from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow from the lost Lenore, from the rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels named Lenore, nameless here, for evermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. Some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This is it, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering long I stood there, wondering, fearing. Doubting, dreaming dreams, no mortal ever dared to dream before, but the silence was unbroken, and the darkness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon I heard again a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely there is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Reevesy, thank you for the host. Open here I flung the shutter when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven. Of the saintly days of yore, not the least obscience made he, not a minute stopped nor stayed he, but with mine of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of fass just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird, beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore, Thou's thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly, grim, and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore? Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, 
nevermore. Much I marvelled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast, upon the sculpted bust upon his chamber door, with such name as nevermore. It did, Reevesy, thank you very much for the raid, massively appreciated. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather then he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, only other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. And then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, Caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster Followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, Till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore, Of never, nevermore. But the raven still beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, Straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust a door, then upon the velvet sinking I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core, this and more I sat divining. With my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight lamp gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloated over, she shall press. Ha! Ah, nevermore. Then methought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose faint footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thou God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite, and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind of hemp, and forget this lost never, Lenore. Quaff the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempest sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror gaunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. And quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by the heaven that bends above us, by that God we bore adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden, who the angels named Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden, who's the angels named Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked, up starting, get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thou soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken, quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak out from my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore, and the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him, streaming, throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul, from out of that shadow that lies floating on the floor, shall be lifted nevermore. You approve. Good, I got a... Thank you very much for the cheer and the bits, Fox. Thank you very much indeed. I hope you enjoyed. That's a good one, that. It's... What you say is if you've never read it. I had, I, I remember I've read it a long time ago, haven't I? I don't know it. Anyway, that was for Mrs. Owl. Um, that was a good one, actually. Maybe I should do more like that. Let us move, let us move genre. Um, 
And Fox, how lovely you are. Not only am I here sipping tea, um, bought um, uh, bought from your from your generosity, but you're, you are again showing the said same generosity. Once more, you absolute star. And Reevesy, if you're still there, you thank you very much for the radio need. They absolutely did come through. Um, I'm sorry, I was I was mid flow, uh, but I didn't want you to think that I uh, that I, that I was not um, <laughs> paying attention. Um, nearly Red Rising, Fox. I'm going to do one brief thing first, um, and then we're going to do some Red Rising. The reason I've picked this is because I've always wanted to do a bit of Lord of the Rings weeding type affair, but this isn't the Lord of the Rings. Um, this is a very brief bit of Tolkien uh, from a book that's been put together by his son from extracts of um, a book that was never finished. It's called Baron and Luthien. The, as, as Mrs. Al calls it, the Tolkien cash grab. <laughs> but it's a fascinating book because it's not really a book because it's a series of manuscripts because he never ever got the book right. And it's so much so that the character of Beren actually changes species because he's rewritten it so many times. At one point he's an elf and at one point he's a man. Um, and it's not the reason I'm... Uh, when, uh, bleh, have a sip of tea and focus words. <laughs> The reason I'm only doing extracts of it is because, really, it's not a continuous thing of prose. It doesn't go from beginning, middle, end. It's not massively cohesive all the way through. But it is quite interesting, and I think it will sound quite nice. So we're going to do a little bit of that, but then we're going to settle in and do uh, Red Rising uh, for, I think, as long as my voice will give us. Um, and then we're going to have a little bit of a chat. Um, because I don't think we can finish Red Rising in one sitting, so Fox and all of you, you might have a guess what, what I might be suggesting at the end of the stream. But hang on to the end of the stream, and uh, we will see. So um, this is a book that was written basically, therefore, somewhere between... Well, I mean, Tolkien was born in 1892, and he wrote this on coming back from World War I in 1940, and he wrote this, and it comes before um, both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings and forms a part of what's called the Cimmerillion, which is basically just a massive compendium of his, his entire universe. Um, so, But this is, in effect, a love story um, between Beren and Luthien. Uh, and Beren is, is, will be set, as we will find, an impossible task. Um, but the book begins um, back before, uh, basically, as I say, The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, we've got no Sauron, the forging of the rings, I don't think has happened by this point. Um, and we begin with the notes on the Elder Days. As you can see, I've also transferred to Kindle for this. The depth in time to which this story reaches back was memorably conveyed in a passage in The Lord of the Rings. At the Great Council in Rivendell, Elrond spoke of the last alliance of men and elves, sorry, of elves and men, we'll get that the right way around, and the defeat of Sauron at the end of the Second Age, more than 3,000 years before. Thereupon, Elrond paused a while and sighed. I remember the splendour of their banners, he said. It recalled to me the glory of the Elder Days and the hosts of Beleriand. So many great princes and captains were assembled, and yet not so many nor so fair as when Thangorodin was broken, and the elves deemed that evil was ended for ever, and it was not so. You remember, said Frodo, speaking his thought aloud in his astonishment, but, but I thought, he stammered as Elrond turned towards him, I thought that the fall of Gilagad was a long age ago. Hi, Lottie, how are you? So it was indeed, answered Elrond gravely, but my memory reaches back even to the elder days. Yarendil was my sire, who was born into Gondolin before its fall, and my mother was Elwing, daughter of Dior, son of Luthien of Doriath. I have seen three ages in the west of the world, and many defeats, and many fruitless victories. Of Morgoth. Morgoth the Black Enemy, as he came to be called, was in him was in his origin as he declared to Hurin, brought captive before him, Melkor, first and mightiest of the Valar, 
who was before the world, now becoming permanently incarnate in the form of a gigantic and majestic but terrible king in the northwest of Middle Earth, he was physically present in his huge fortress of Angband, the Hells of Iron, the Black Creek that issued from the summits of Thangordin, the mountains that he piled above Angband could be seen far off staining the northern sky. It is said in the annals of Beleriand that the gates of Morgoth were but 150 leagues from the bridge of Menegroth, far and yet all too near. These words refer to the bridge leading to the dwellings of the elvish king Thingol. They were called Menegroth, the Thousand Caves. But, being incarnate, Morgoth was afraid. My father wrote of him, as he grew in malice and sent forth from him the evil that he conceived in lies and creatures of wickedness, his power passed into them and was dispersed, and he himself became ever more earthbound, unwilling to issue from his dark strongholds. Thus, when Thingol, Thingolfing, High King of the Nol Dorin Elves, rode alone to Angband to challenge Morgoth to combat, he cried at the gate, Come forth, thou coward king, to fight with thine own hand. Den dweller, wielder of thralls, liar and lurker, foe of gods and elves, come, for I would see thy craven face. Then it is told Morgoth came, for he could not refuse such a challenge before the face of his captains. He fought with the great hammer Grond, which at each blow made a great pit, and he beat Fingolfin to the ground, but as he died he pinned the great foot of Morgoth to the earth and the black blood gushed forth and filled the pits of the ground. Morgoth went ever halt thereafter, so although when Beren and Luthien will make their way into the deepest hall in Angband where Morgoth sat, Luthien cast a spell on him and suddenly he fell as a hill sliding in avalanche and hurled like thunder from his, thro from his throne, he lay prone upon the floors of hell. Now that is apparently the introduction. Um, I am now trying to find where the book starts. <laughs> so there we are. That's a, a little glimpse into where we're starting from. So we basically have the, the, the start of the great evils and they are puncturing the world of, that, that Tolkien has in mind. Um, and the more they do, the less powerful they're becoming because they are being bound to the immortal. So that's the preface to Beren and Luthien. So we'll do a little bit of the start of this and then we're going to move on to Fox's um, request, which will be our reading for a while, which will be red writing. Mm. Oh, that's good tea. And hello Lottie. Sorry, I was in mid-flow, wasn't I? I hope you're well. Are you streaming today? There's a lot of preface in all of this book. Where on earth is the actual start of it? <laughs> the only problem is I was using the Kindle and not being able to find where the book starts, <laughs> what the introduction is. Um, come on, where is chapter one, please? If there is a chapter one. How are you? And no, my husband is home today. Oh, you're taking the night off. Oh, it's nice. Right, interestingly, the, hmm. so the Kindle version has not actually broken apart the chapters. So I think we go from here. Hang on. Maybe I should have bought this one. Yours will be easier, Fox. It actually has chapters, I've checked. Um, <laughs> um, here we are. At least I thought that would work. Right, this isn't going very well because I'm going to have to mark in here. No, I'm going to actually, I'm going to skip that. Oh, he's finally back from the army. Oh, wow. Well, thanks to him for his service. I'm glad he's back and all well. So, in fact, Fox, change of plan. Until I can mark properly Beren and Luthien up, 
um, so that I can actually read through it properly. Um, we are going to start with your request. Uh, and this, ladies and gentlemen, I've never read this book. I've never read any of the ones today, actually, apart from um, The Raven Poem, which I've read ages ago and sort of forgot about. Um, this is a book by Pierce Brown. Uh, it is called Red Rising. Um, it is, I think, uh, I shall say, simply put, it is a dystopian future. I think we're based on Mars. And I shall simply read the rather nice introduction as it dedicated to Father, who taught me to walk. It's quite nice. Here we are. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get settled in for a little bit of a reading of Red Rising. I would have lived in peace, but my enemies brought me war. I watched 1,200 of their strongest sons and daughters, listening to a pitiless golden man speaking between great marble pillars, listening to the beast who brought the flame that gnaws at my heart. All men are not created equal, he declared. Tall, imperious, and evil of a man. The weak have deceived you. They would say the meek should inherit the earth, but the strong should nurture the gentle. This is the noble lie of democracy, the cancer that poisoned mankind. His eyes pierced the gathered students. You and I are gold. We are the end of the evolutionary line. We tower above the flesh heap of man, shepherding the lesser colours. You have inherited this legacy, he pauses, studying the faces in the assembly, but it is not free. Power must be claimed, wealth won. Rule, domination, empire purchased with blood. You scarless children deserve nothing. You do not know pain. You do not know what your forefathers sacrificed to place you on these heights, but soon you will. Soon we will teach you why gold rules mankind, and I promise of those amongst you only those fit for power will survive. Welcome back, Omega. Oh, your stream went down. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, obviously we're very grateful to have you back here, but I'm sorry it went down. Um, but I am no gold. I am a red. He thinks men like me weak. He thinks me dumb, feeble, subhuman. I was not raised in palaces. I did not ride horses through meadows and eat meals of hummingbird tongues. I was forged in the bowels of this hard world, sharpened by hate, strengthened by love. He's wrong. None of them will survive. I love it that Mrs. Al is pulling the most amazing faces to make me laugh. <laughs> I love you. You love it. Um, also, Mrs. Phoenix says she likes your slippers. Ah, so I like them too. But this is our, um, our, our nod to Korean manners. Uh, we, we have guest slippers everywhere. and I rather like them because they're sort of nice. and makes you feel like you're in a spa. Um, oh, no, I'm not streaming. I was talking about your feed. Oh, right. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, I, I beg your pardon. Um... We are still here. Um, we've moved on to Red Rising. Um, I like this great introduction. That's marvellous. Um, yeah, Fox, good choice. Mm. Part one, slave. There is a flower that grows on Mars. It is red and harsh and fit for our soil. It is called Hamantheus. It means blood blossom. Chapter One, Helm Diver. Fur? <laughs> Holy Diver, but Hell Diver. The first thing you should know about me is I am my father's son, and when they came for him, I did as he asked. I did not cry. Not when the society televised the arrest, not when the golds tried him, not when the greats hanged him. Mother hit me from, hit me from that. My brother Kieran was supposed to be the stoic one. He was the elder, I the younger. I was supposed to cry. Indeed, Kieran bawled like a girl when little Eo tucked Hamantheus into father's left work boot and ran back to her own father's side. My sister Leanna murmured a lament besides me. I just watched and thought it a shame that he died dancing 
but without his dancing shoes. On Mars, there is not much gravity, so you have to pull the feet to break the neck. They let the loved ones do it. I smell my own stink inside my fry suit. The suit is some kind of nanoplastic and it's hot, and its name suggests it insulates me toe to head. Nothing gets in, nothing gets out. Especially not the heat. The worst part is you can't wipe the sweat from your eyes. It damn stings as it goes through the headband and puddle at the heels. Not to mention the stink when you piss. Which you always do. You've got to take in a load of water through the drink tube. I guess you could be fit and with a catheter. We choose to stink. The drillers of my clan chatter some gossip over the calm in my ear and I ride atop the claw drill. I'm alone in this deep tunnel on a machine built like a titanic metal hand. One that na- grasps and gnaws at the ground. I control its rock melting digits from the holster seat atop the drill, just where your elbow joint would be. There my fingers fit into control gloves that manipulate the many tentacle like drills some 90 metres below my perch. To be a hell diver, they say your fingers must flicker faster as tongues of fire. Mine flicker faster. Despite the voices in my ear, I am alone in the deep tunnel. My existence is vibration, the echo of my own breath, and heat so thick and noxious, it feels like I'm swaddling in a heavy quilt of hot piss. A new river of sweat breaks through the scarlet sweatband tied around my forehead and slips into my eyes, burning them till they're as red as my rusty hair. I used to reach and try to wipe the sweat away, only to scratch futilely at the faceplate of my fry suit. I still want to. Even after three years, the tickle and sting of the sweat is a raw misery. The tunnel walls around my holster seat have bathed a sulfurous yellow by a corona of lights. The reach of the light fades as I look up and it's a thin vertical shaft I've carved today. Above, bre- sorry, coffee machine's cleaning itself. Above, precious helium-3 glimmers like liquid silver. But I'm looking at the shadows, looking for the pit vipers that curl through the darkness, seeking the warmth of my drill. They'll eat into your suit too, bite through the shell and try to burrow into the warmest place they could find, usually your belly. So they can lay their eggs. I've been bitten before. I still dream of the beast, black, like a thick tendril of oil. They can get as wide as a thigh and as long as three men, but it's the babies we fear. They don't know how to ration their poison. Like me, their ancestors came from Earth. Then Mars and the deep tunnels changed them. It is eerie in the deep tunnels. It's lonely. Beyond the roar of the drill, I hear the voices of my friends, all older, but I cannot see them. A half a click above me in the darkness. They drill high above, near the mouth of the tunnel that I've carved, descending with hooks and lines to dangle along the sides of that tunnel to get at the small veins of helium-3. They mine with meter-long drills, gobbling up the chaff. The work still requires mad dexterity of foot and hand, but I'm the earner in this crew. I am the hell diver. It takes a certain kind, and I'm the youngest anyone can remember. I've been in the mines for three years. He starts at 13. Old enough to screw, old enough to crew. At least that's what Uncle Narrow said. Except I didn't get married till six months back, so I don't know why he said it. Ao dances through my thoughts as I peer into my control display and slip the crawl drill's fingers around a fresh vein. Ao. Sometimes it's difficult to think of her as anything but what we used to call her as children. Little Ao, a tiny little girl, hidden behind a mane of red. Red like the rock around me, not true red, rust red. Red like our home, like Mars. She's 16 too, and she may be like me. From a clan of red earth diggers, a clan of song and dance and soul, but she could be made from air. From the ether that binds the stars in a patchwork. Not that I've ever seen the stars. No red from the mining colony sees the stars. Little Ao, they wanted to marry her off when she turned 14, like all girls of the clans, but she took the short rations and waited for me to reach 16. Wed age for men before slipping that cord around her finger. She said she knew we'd marry since we were children. I did. Hold, hold, hold. Uncle Norell snaps over the comm child. Darrow, hold, boy. My fingers freeze. 
He's high above me with the rest of them, watching my progress on his head unit. What's the burn? I ask, annoyed. I don't like being interrupted. What's the burn? The little hell diver asks, while Barlow chuckles. Gas pocket, that's what, Narrow snaps. He's the head talk for our 200 plus crew. Hold. I'm calling a scan crew to check the particulars before you blow us all to hell. That gas pocket is a tiny one, I say, more like a gas pimple. I can manage it. The ear on the drill and he thinks he knows his head from his hole. Poor little pissant, old Barlow adds. Remember the words of our golden leader, patience and obedience. Patience is the better part of value and obedience the better part of humanity. Listen to your elders. I roll my eyes at the epigram. If the elders could do what I can, maybe listening would have had its merits, but they are slow in hand and mind, and sometimes I feel like they just want me to be just the same. Especially my uncle. I'm on a tear, I say. If you think there's a gas pocket, I can just hop down and hand scan it. Easy, no dilly-dally. They'll preach caution, as if caution has ever helped them. We haven't won a laurel in ages. Want to make A.O. a widow? Barlow laughs, voice crackling with static. Okay by me. She's a pretty little thing. Drill into that pocket and leave her to me. Old and fat I be, but my drill still digs a dent. A chorus of laughter comes from the 200 drillers above, and my knuckles turn white as I grip the controls. Listen to Uncle Narrow, Darrow. Better to back off till we can get on reading. My brother adds, he's three years older, makes him think he's a sage and knows more. He's just knows caution. There'll be time. Time? Hell, it'll be hours, I snap. They're all against me in this. They're all wrong and slow and don't understand that Laurel is only a bold move away. More, they doubt me. You are being a coward, Narrow. Silence on the other end of the line. Calling a man a coward is not a good way to get his cooperation. I shouldn't have said it. I say make the scan yourself. Lauren, my cousin and narrow son Scorps, don't and Gamma is good as gold. I'll get the laurel for oh the hundredth time. The laurel, 24 clans in the underground mining colony of Lycos. One laurel per quarter. It means more food than you can eat. It means more burners to smoke. Imported quilts from Earth Amber swill with the society's quality markings. It means winning. Gamma clan has had it since anyone can remember. So it's always been about the quota for us lesser clans, just enough to scrape by. Ao says the laurel is the carrot the society dangles, always just far enough for beyond our grasp, just enough so we know how short we really are and how little we can do about it. But we're supposed to be pioneers. Ao calls us slaves. I just think we never try hard enough, never take the big risks because of the old men. Lauren, shut up about the laurel. Hit the gas and we'll miss all the bloody damn laurels to kingdom come, boy. Uncle Narelle growls at him. He's slurring. I can practically smell the drink through the comm. He wants to call a sensor team to cover his own ass. Wasn't he always scared? The drunk was born pissing himself out of fear. Fear of what? Our overlords, the gold, their minions, the greys? Who knows? Few people. Who cares? Even fewer. Actually, just one man cared for my uncle, and he died when my uncle pulled his feet. My uncle is weak. He is cautious and moderate, his drink a pale shadow of my father. He blink, his blinks are long and hard, as though it pains him to open his eyes each time and see the world again. I don't trust him down here in the mines, or anywhere for that matter, but my mother would tell me to listen to him. She would remind me to respect my elders, even though I am red. Even though I am the hell diver of my clan, she would say that my blisters have not yet become calluses. I will obey, even though it is as maddening as the tickle of the sweat on my face. Fine, I mutter. I clench the drill fist and wait. My uncle calls it in from the safety of the chamber above the deep tunnel. This will take hours. I do the math. Eight hours till whistle call. To beat Gamma, I've got to keep a rate of 156.5 kilograms an hour. It'll take two and a half hours for the scan crew to get down here and do their best, to do their deal at best. So I've got to pump out 227.6 kilograms per hour. Impossible. If I keep going and squab the tedious scan, it's ours. I wonder if Uncle Narol and Barlow know how close we are. Probably. Probably just don't think anything is even worth the risk. Probably think di divine intervention will squab our chances. Gamma, 
as the laurel. That's the way things are and will ever be. We of Lambda just try to scrape by on our foodstuffs and meagre comforts. No rising, no falling. Nothing is worth the risk of changing the hierarchy. My father found that out at the end of a rope. Nothing is worth risking death. Against my chest, I feel the wedding band of hair and silk dangling from the cord around my neck and think of Ao's ribs. I'll see a few more of the slender things through her skin this month. She'll go asking the Gamma families for scraps behind my back. I'll act like I don't know, but will still be hungry. I eat too much because I'm 16 and still grown tall. She lies and says she's never got much of an appetite. Some women sell themselves for food or luxuries to the tin pots, greys, to be technical about it. The society's garrison up troops on our little mining colony. She wouldn't sell her body to feed me. Would she? But then I think about it and I do anything to feed her. I look down over the edge of my drill. It's a long fall to the bottom of the hole I've dug. Nothing but molten rock and hissing drills, but before I know what's what, I'm out of my straps, scanner in hand, and I'm jumping down the hundred metre drop towards the drill fingers. I kick back and forth between the vertical mine shaft's walls and the drill's long, vibrating body to slow my fall. I make sure I'm not near a pit viper nest when I throw out an arm to catch myself on a gear just above the drill fingers. The ten drills glow with the heat. The air shimmers and distorts. I can feel the heat on my face, feel it stabbing my eyes, feeling it ache in my belly and balls. Those drills will melt your bones if you're not careful. And I'm not careful. I'm just nimble. I lower myself, hand over hand, going feet first between the drill fingers so I can lower the scanner close enough to the gas pocket to get a reading. The heat's unbearable. This was a mistake. Voices shout at me through the comm. I almost brush one of the drills and I finally lower myself close enough to the gas pocket. The scanner flickers in my hand as it takes a reading. My suit is bubbling and I smell something sweet and sharp, like burning syrup. To a hell diver, it's the smell of death. Oh, and that's chapter one. So it's um so this basically sounds like you know the UK's current uh, blend of uh, lower middle and upper class. Uh, it's it's gripping, Fox. It's nicely written. This it's um it 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 works very easily to get you into the. I spoke with so much. I'm trying to struggle with words. I what I'm trying to say. It doesn't take a lot to project you into the atmosphere of it. It doesn't waste a great deal of time with exposition, um, which is also a very nice touch after having read Tolkien, you know, or tried to for a few minutes, which is all massive exposition to discussion and huge tangents. It's a case of you're in, here's the story, what's going on. Um, you know, you don't really need a great deal to be punched right into the story. Um, and to immediately get the notions of political and economic oppression and dissent that it causes. Um, yeah. Where are we? What do you think? Should we do one more chapter? And then I shall, um, I shall give all of your ears and my voice a rest. <laughs> we'll have a brief chat before we head off. What do we think? One more, folks? Are you all right with your drink over there, my love? Or do you want another one? Sure. Oh, I've got hydrates from Omega. Thank you very much. I'm trying again. Now I can't draw bodies. So she's just going to have to be a bodiless lady. <laughs> bodiless lady. I love the hat. Uh, Do you not want a light on that? Well, it has an effect. Me. Hang on, I'm going to put a light on for Mrs. Alba because... So I also need some tea. Give me two seconds, folks. Oh, I'm just... That's all right, hang on. Put some lights on. There's a bucket. Oh, I think I can do the head. I can't do the body. You can't do the body. I can't draw. I can't draw real looking things. I think you can. 
Well, I know that my aunt's I don't lose. Oh, here we go. Right. And thank you again to... Oh, thank you again to Fox for the tip a while ago. We are currently drinking the tea that we bought with it. So, uh, uh, cheers, Fox. Thank you very much for that. Legend for re reading for nearly three hours straight. Do you know what? It has, however, educated me because I had been wondering about doing a stream um, for charity based upon the notion of a filibuster, um, which is a political tool. You may or may not know this. So I'm preaching to the choir. I apologise. But it's where, in political speak, you stand up and keep talking and not stop. You can't sit down, you can't have a drink, you can't go to the loo. You stand up and you talk non-stop until the clock runs out on whatever the political session is to stop something from happening. Um, I'd wondered about doing it for charity and I'm realising that I've been going for about <clears throat> three hours, sat down, um, <laughs> and e even I can feel the tickle in my voice and I've had... Omega has saved me many times by giving me hydrate. I think it would be an enormous challenge. Um, so I think I may mull on it some more because um, it would have to be a big, big event and we'd have to really hype that one up because otherwise that's... Um, I have infinite respect now for people who have filibustered. Because you, you can't even wet your whistle. Um, anyway, that's a random tangent. So let's have chapter two. Um, because I've now, we, we now have light for artwork. So chapter two of Red Rising, uh, titled The Township. My suit can't handle the heat down here. The outer layer is nearly melted through. Soon the second layer will go. Then the scanner blinks silver and I've got what I came for. I almost didn't notice. I'm dizzy, I'm frightened. I pull myself away from the drills. Hand over hand, I took my body up going fast away from the dreadful heat. Then something catches. My foot is jammed just underneath one of the gears near a drill finger. I gasp down air in a sudden panic. The dread rises in me. I see my boot heel melting. The first layer goes, then the second bubbles. Then it will be my flesh. I force a long breath and choke down the screams that are rising in my throat. I remember the blade. I flip out my hinged sing blade from its black holster. It's a cruelly curved cutter, as long as my leg, meant for taking off and cauterizing limbs stuck in machinery, just like this. Most men panic when they get caught, and so the sling blade is a nasty half-moon weapon, meant to be used by clumsy hands. Even filled with terror, my hands are not clumsy. I slice three times with it, cutting nanoplastic instead of flesh. On the third swing, I reach down and jerk free my leg. As I do, my knuckles brush the edge of the drill. Searing pain shoots through my hand. I smell crackling flesh, but I'm up and I'm off. I'm climbing away from the hellish heat, climbing back to my holster seat um, and laughing all the while. I feel like crying. My uncle was right, I was wrong, but I'll be damned if I'll ever let him know it. Idiot, is his kindest comment. You're a maniac. You're a bloody damn maniac, Lauren whoops. Minimal gas, I say. Drilling now, Uncle. <laughs> the hall backs take my paw when the whistle call down. I push myself out of the drill, leaving it in the deep tunnel for the night shift, and snag a weary hand on the line the others drop down, the kilometre-long shaft to help me up. Dis despite the seeping burn on the back of my hand, I slide my body upwards on the line until I'm out of the shaft. Kieran and Lauren walk with me to join the others at the nearest grav lift. I've accidentally pressed the next page. Uh, yellow lights dangle like spiders from the ceiling. My clan and Gamma's 300 men already have their toes under the metal railing when we reach the rectangular grav lift. I avoid my uncle. He's mad enough to spit and catch a few dozen pats on the back for my stunt. The young ones, like me, think we've won the laurel. They know my raw helium-3 pull for the month. Better than gammas, the old turds just grumble and say we're fools. I hide my hand and duck my toes in. Gravity alters and we shoot upwards. A gamma scab with less than a week's worth of rust under his nails forgets to put his toes under the railings, so he hangs suspended as the lift shoots up six vertical kilometres. Ears are popping. Got a floating gamma turd here, Barlow laughs through the lambers. 
Petty as it may seem, it's always nice seeing a gamma squab something. They get more food, more burners, more everything because of the laurel. We get to despise them. But then we're supposed to, I think. I wonder if they'll despise us now. Enough's enough. I grip, I grip the rust net red nanoplastic of the kid's fry suit and jerk him down. Kid, that's a laugh. He's hardly three years younger than I am. He's deathly tired, but when he sees the blood red of my fry suit, he stiffens, avoids my eyes, and becomes the only one to see the burn on my hand. I wink at him and I think he shits his suit. We all do it now and then. I remember when I met my first hell diver, I thought he was a god. He's dead now. Up top in the staging depot, a big grey cavern of concrete and metal, we pop our tops and drink down the fresh cold air of a world far removed from molten drills. Our collective stink and sweat soon make a bog of the air, a bog of the area. Lights flicker in the distance, telling us to stay clear of the magnetic horizon tram tracks on the other side of the depot. We don't mingle with the gammas as we head for the horizon tram in a staggered line of rust red suits, half with lambda L's, half with gamma canes, painting a dark red on their backs. Two scarlet head togs, two blood red hell divers. Cadre of tin pots eye us as we trudge by over the worn concrete floor. Their grey dura arm is simple and tired, as unkept as their hair. It would stop a simple blade, maybe an ion blade, and a pulse blazer or a razor wouldn't go would go through it like paper. But we've only seen those on the whole account. The greys don't even bother to make a show of force. Their thumpers dankle at their sides. They know they won't have to use them. Obedience is the highest virtue. The grey captain, an ugly Dan, a greasy bastard, throws a pebble at me. Though his skin is darkened from exposure to the sun, his hair is grey like the rest of his colour, hangs thin and weedy over his eyes. Two ice cubes are old and ash. The sickles of his colour blocky grey symbol like the number four, with several bars beside it, mark along each hand and wrist. Cruel and stark, like all of the greys. I heard they pulled Ugly Dan off the front line back in Eurasia, wherever that is, after he got crippled and they didn't want to buy him a new arm. He has an old replacement model now, he's insecure about it, so I make sure he sees me give the arm a glance. Saw you had an exciting day, darling. His voice is as stale and heavy as the air inside my fry suit. Brave hero now, are you? I always thought you'd be a brave hero. You're the hero, I say, nodding to his arm. And you think you're smart, don't you? Just a red. He winks at me. Say hello to your little birdie for me. A ripe thing for a piggin. He licks his teeth. Even for a ruster. Never seen a bird. Except on the HC. Isn't that a thing? He chuckles. Wait, where are you going? He asks as I turn. About your betters won't go awry, don't you think? And he snickers to his fellows. Careless of his mockery, I turn and bow deeply. My uncle sees this and turns from it, disgusted. We leave them behind. I don't mind bowing, but I'll probably cut ugly Dan's throat if I ever get the chance. Kind of like saying I'll take a zip out of Venus in a torch ship if I ever suit my fancy. Hey, Dago, Dago, Lauren calls to Gamma's hell diver. The man's a legend, all the other divers just a flash in the pan. I might be better than him. What did you pull? Dago, a pale strip of old leather with a smirk on his face, lights a long burner and puffs out a cloud. <sighs> Don't know, he draws. Come on. Don't care. Raw count never matters, Lambda. Oh, bloody hell it doesn't. What did he pull over this week? Lauren calls as he loads in the tram. Everyone's lighting burners and popping out the swill, but they're all listening intently. 9,821 kilos, a gamma boasts. At this, I lean back and smile. I hear cheers from the younger lambdas. The old hands don't react. I'm busy wondering what Aya will do with sugar this month. We've never earned sugar before. Only ever won it at cards. And fruit. I've heard that Laurel gets you fruit. She'd probably give it all the way to the hungry children just to prove to the society she doesn't need their prizes. Me, I'd eat the fruit and play politics on a full stomach. But she's got the passion for ideas. Well, I've got no extra passion for anything but her. Still won't win. There go draws as the tram starts away. Darrow's a young pot, but he's smart enough to know that, aren't you, Darrow? Young or not, I'll beat your craggy ass. You sure about that? Deadly sure, I wink. And blow him a kiss. Laurel's ours. Send your sisters to my township for sugar this time. My friends laugh and slap the fry suit lids onto their thighs. 
Diego watches me. After a moment, he drags his burner deep. It glows bright and burns fast. This is for you, he says to me. In half a minute, the burner is a husk. After disembarking the horizon tram, I funnel into the flush with the rest of the crews. The place is cold, musty, and smells exactly like what it is. A cramped metal shed where thousands of men strip off fry suits after hours of pissing and sweating to take air showers. I peel off my suit, put on one of our hair caps, and walk naked to the stand in the nearest transparent tube. There are dozens of them lined up in the flush. Here there is no dancing, no boastful flips. The only camaraderie is exhaustion and the soft slapping of hands on thighs creating a rhythm with the swoosh and shoot of the showers. The door to my tube hisses closed behind me, muffling the sounds of music. A familiar hum comes from the motor, followed by a great rush of atmosphere and a sucking resonance as air filled with antibacterial molecules screams from the top of the machine and shoots over my skin to whisk away dead skin and filth down the drains the bottom of the tube. It hurts. After, I part with Lauren and Kieran and they go to the common to drink and dance in the taverns before the Laurel Tide dance officially starts. The tin pots will be handing out the allowances of all the foodstuffs and announcing the Laurel at midnight. They'll be dancing before and after for us on the day shift. The legends say that the god Mars with the parent of tears, foe to dance and loot. As to the former, I agree. We of the colony of Lycos, one of the first colonies under Mars' surface, are a people of dance and song and family. We spit on that legend and make our own birthright. It is the one resistance we can manage against society that rules us. Give us a bit of spine. They don't care that we dance or that we sing, so long as we obediently dig. So long as we prepare the planet for the rest of them, yet to remind us of our place, they make one song and one dance punishable by death. My father made that dance his last. I'd seen it only once, and I've heard the song only once as well. I didn't understand when I was little. One about distant valves, missed, lost lovers, and a reaper meant to guide us to our unseen home. I was small and curious when the woman sang it as her son was hanged for stealing foodstuffs. He would have been a tall boy, but he could never get enough food to put meat on his bones. His mother died next. The people of Lycos did the fading dirge for them, the tragic thumping of fists against chests, fading slowly, slowly, till their fists, like her heart, beat no more, and all dispersed. The sound haunted me that night. I cried alone in our small kitchen, wondering why I cried then when I had not from my father. As I lay on the cold floor, I heard a soft scratching at my family door. When I opened the door, I found a small hamantheus bud nestled in the red dirt, not a soul to be seen. Only Ao's tiny footprints in the dirt. That is the second time she brought flowers after death. Since song and dance are in our blood, I suppose it's not surprising that I was in both that I first realised that I loved Ao. Not little Ao, not as she was, but Ao as she is. She says she loved me before they hanged my father. But it was in a smoky tavern when her rusty hair swirled and her feet moved with the zither and her hips to the drums that my heart forgot a couple of beats. It was not her flips or cartwheels, nor the boastful foolery that so marks the dance of the young. Hers was graceful, proud movement. Without me, she would not eat. Without her, I would not live. She may tease me for saying so, but she is the spirit of our people. Life's dealt us a hard hand. We're to sacrifice for the good of men and women we don't know. We're to dig to ready mass for others. That makes us some kind of nasty-minded folk. But her kindness, her laughter, her fierce will, is the best that can come from a home such as ours. I look for her in my family's offshoot township, just a half mile's worth of tunnel road away from the common. The township's one of two dozen uh, surrounding the common. It's a hive-like cluster of homes carved into the rock walls of the old mines. Stone and earth are our ceilings, our floors, our home. The clan is a giant family. Ayo grew up not a stone's throw from my house. Her brothers are like my own. Her father is like the one I lost. A mess of electrical wires tangled together along the cavern ceiling like a jungle of black and red vines. Lights hanging down from the jungle swaying gently 
as air from the common central oxygen system circulates. At the centre of the township dangles a massive holocam. It's a square box with images on each side. Pixels are blacked out and the image is faded and fuzzy, but never has the thing faltered. Never has it turned off. It bathes our cluster of homes in its own pale light and videos from the society. My family's home is carved into the rock a hundred metres from the bottom floor of the township. A steep path leads from it to the ground, though, pu through, so, though pulleys and ropes can also bear uh, one up to the town's greatest heights. Only the old or infirm use those, and we have few of either. Our house has few rooms. Uh, Ao and I only recently were able to take a room for ourselves. Kieran and his family have two rooms and my mother and sister share the other. All landers in Lycos live in our township. Omega, an obsidian neighbour, helps just a minute's worth of wide tunnel over to either side. We're all connected, except for the gamma. Omega, thank you for the hydrate. I'm going to take that. Gamma live in the common, above the taverns, above the repair booths, the silk shops and trade bazaars. The tin pots live in a fortress above that nearer the barren surface of our harsh world. That's where the ports lie that bring the foodstuffs from Earth to us marooned pioneers. The holocan above me shows images of mankind's struggles, which are then followed by soaring music as the society's triumphs flash past. The society's sigil, the golden pyramid, with three parallel bars attached to the pyramid's three faces, a circle surround, surrounding all burns into the screen. The voice of Octavia Olum, the society's aged sovereign, narrates the struggle man faces in colonising the planets and moons of the system. Since the dawn of man, our saga as a species has been one of tribal warfare. It has been one of trial, one of sacrifice, one of daring to defy nature's natural limits. Now, through duty and obedience, we are united, but our struggle is no different. Sons and daughters of all colours, we are asked to sacrifice yet again. Here, in our finest hour, we cast our best seeds to the stars. Who will flourish? Sorry, where first shall we flourish? Venus, Mercury, Mars, the moons of Neptune, Jupiter? Her voice grows solemn as her, oops, her, her voice grows solemn as her ageless face with its regal cast peers down. Her hand shimmers with the symbol of gold and blazoned upon their backs. A dot in the centre of a winged circle. Gold winged marks the sides of her forearms. Only one imperfection mars her golden face. A long crescent scar running along her right cheekbone. Her beauty is that of a cruel bird of prey. You brave red pioneers of Mars, strongest of the human breed, sacrifice for progress, sacrifice to pave the way for the future. Your lives, your blood, are a down payment for the immortality of the human race as we move beyond Earth and Moon. You go where we could not. You suffer so that others do not. I salute you. I love you. The helium-3 that you mine is the lifeblood of the terraforming process. Soon, the red planet will have breathable air, livable soil, and soon, when Mars is habitable, when you brave pioneers have made ready the red planet for a softer colours, we will join you, and you will be held in highest esteem beneath the sky your, so your toil created. Your sweat and blood fuels the terraforming. Brave pioneers, always remember that obedience is the highest virtue. Above all, obedience, respect, sacrifice, hierarchy. I find the kitchen room with the home empty, but I hear Ao in the bedroom. Stop right where you are, she commands through the door. Do not, under any condition, look in this room. Okay. I stop. She comes out a minute later, flustering and blushing. Her hair is covered in dust and webs. I rake my hands through the tangle. She's straight from the webbery where they harvest the biosilk. You didn't go in the flush, I say, smiling. Didn't have time. Had a skirt to pick out of the webbery to pick something up. What did you pick up? She smiles sweetly. You didn't marry me because I tell you everything, remember? And do not go in that room.
I make a lunge for the door. She blocks me and pulls my sweatband down over my eyes. Her forehead pushes against my chest. I laugh. I move the band and grip her shoulders to push her back enough to look in her eyes. Or what? I ask with raised eyebrows. She just smiles at me and cocks her head. I back away from the metal door. I dive into molten mine shifts without a blink. But there are some warnings you can back off. And there are others you can't. She stands on her tiptoe and pecks me good on the nose. Good boy, I knew you'd be easy to train, she says. Then her nose wrinkles because she smells my burn. She doesn't cover me, doesn't berate me, doesn't even speak except to say I love you, with just a hint of worry in her voice. She picks the metal pieces, the melted pieces of my fry suit out of the wound, which stretches from my knuckles to my wrist and pulls tight a web wrap with antibiotic and nerve nucleic. I should pronounce that right. Where did you get that, I ask? If I don't lecture you, you don't quiz me on what's what. I kiss her on the nose and play with the thin band of woven hair around her ring finger. My hair, wound with bits of silk, makes her wedding band. I have a surprise for you tonight, she tells me, and I have one for you, I say, thinking of the laurel. I pull my sweat band on her head like a crown. She wrinkles her nose at its wetness. Oh, well, I actually have two for you, Dara. Pity you didn't think ahead. You might have got me a cube of sugar or a satin sheet or maybe even a coffee to go with the first gift. Coffee, I laugh. What sort of colour did you think you married? She sighs. No benefits to a diver, not at all. Crazy, stubborn and rash, dexterous, I say, with a mischievous side, smile. And I'm going to skip this that bit just in case my nieces happen to be watching. Um... <laughs> Um, she swats my hand away like it's a spider. Now put these gloves on unless you want to jabber for a, unless you want jabber from the women. Your mother's already gone on ahead. And that ends chapter two. Uh, yeah, you d Fox did warn me there was one spot to uh, skirt um, for <laughs> the benefit of possibly younger ears. So thank you for that. So that, ladies and gentlemen, was chapter two um, of. Uh, Red Rising, so we're getting to know um, the sort of layout of this particular um, colony. It's, um, it sounds, seems like very much like a film that I've watched with Sean Connery, and I'm trying to remember the name of it. But then again, suppose if it's a film about Mars and mining, and it's a book about Mars and mining, of course, there might be some associations in my mind. Um, but I think, ladies and gentlemen, I think that's where we'll call the reading uh, for today. Uh, we've been going for about three hours now, um, but that's uh, an opportunity to give a massive thank you from me um, because we're obviously doing this because you guys raised 20,000 um, uh, community chat points. Um, they also don't stay long in the mines. Oh, right. Uh, OK, um, we should look forward to that. But the current thought is that I have is that if this is something that particularly if subs enjoy, um, or we enjoy generally, whether or not we might have a monthly, uh, basically, book club, um, if there's enough interest in it to do, sort of um, once a month on a Sunday. Because um, there's lots of things that people would like to have read uh, and seem to uh, seem to enjoy. And we've got the Discord channel where we can take suggestions. So I can also see from the bottom of my Kindle, there's plenty to read of Red Rising as a start. And we've got whole world of literature, poems, and you name it to, uh, to pick from. So I shall put the thoughts out there on social media. And if, if it's got enough interest, then maybe we will do just that. Um, so th th there we go. Um, but I'm, again, very grateful to the suggestions. Um, the cool idea. Good. I, I'd, I'd like to do things, because like, I, I know the Lego was um, very enjoyable. So I've got a couple of other thoughts about things similar to that. Um, and then there's the, the, the piano based, um, the music based streams um, to, to come as well. But particularly, um, I think if the reading is enjoyable, I'm wondering whether or not it might be nice as a, as a thank you particularly to subs. Can you do sub only streams? Is that a thing? Because if we if we've got a certain Sunday every um, every month and it's then just for um, don't think so no I'm I'm I must be imagining that am I thinking that you can or you can I'll look into it um, because particularly it's nice to give um, it's in the mod section oh right okay 
There we go. Fox, bringer of tea, tips, cheers, and then actual guidance, because I know nothing about technology. <laughs> Um, so that that's what that's kind of what I was thinking because you know if you guys are kind enough to sub then you should get something nice back and maybe something just for you just like this and then um, you do, Fox you, you have my back in tea support and technology you are you are absolutely there you, you, uh, <laughs> thank you thank you um, right so I, I will put the thoughts out there with the subs and people generally and if it's um, something people would like then we will do just that and it'll be just for just for the subs super well in that case i think the next time we'll be on is going to be wednesday which i think was um tempering chocolate i think i had in mind but it might turn into healthy chicken or both but not mixed i'm not going to temper chocolate over healthy chicken thank you very much reezy and thank you very much omega i'm really glad you all enjoyed it um, I really was curious as to how many people would want to listen to me talk for, well, now approaching three, three hours, three and a half hours. Um, but I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Um, I'll put the feelers out there, see what people like and what, what they feel like um, uh, doing that on repeat. Um, and is anyone, I, I, I can actually, uh, oh, of course, yes. Um, Reezy and Cinders will, of course, be away having their wedding day on Wednesday. Um, and we will enjoy our evening. Is anyone streaming by the way that we can host? Because uh, I actually have the laptop down here, so I could actually... Hang on, let's just have a look down. Do, 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 do. I'm a bit early for Philama, I know. Um, tell you what. Oh, did you not know, Omega? Yes, uh, Reevesy and Cinders is getting married this Wednesday. Who shall we go and see? Say hello to. Yes, there we go. I shall do that, Omega, because I was getting stuck for... I do indeed. So... try and type this correctly um oh yes no no i, I do i do follow her. i've got her here l y n d z e e and then underscore tv and we've not raided her before so have i done that right this channel is intended for mature audiences what's she doing <laughs> hang on Oh, Call of Duty. Oh, that'll be why. Oh, that's very sensible of putting that. Um, there we go. So, everybody, thank you all. This is your this is your stream, your community stream. So, I hope you enjoyed. It's been my pleasure. Um, let's go and... Uh, she swears a lot. <laughs> right, okay. Um, well, in that case, let's go and say hello to her. Let's throw some emotes in her general direction. Generalised support. So... All the very best, everyone. We'll see you Wednesday. We'll obviously talk to those of you who are streaming tonight later on. And Fox, thank you for the tea suggestion tips. You have been a star uh, in this particular stream. Um, so massive shout out to you. Um, and we will be back with more reading. So take care and until then, everybody.